Hey, Film Vault. Welcome everyone to the Film Vaults. Glad to be back with you. I'm Brian Mitchell. That's Anderson. Bringing you top five movies shot in Japan to commemorate the return of one Anderson to the show. How are you, buddy? I'm, I'm, I'm good, bud. I'm, I'm happy to be uh, doing the show again. It feels like it's been forever, and I feel like uh, I've been gone for months. It's, you brought it's, us the uh, the Japanese virus. Uh, I mean, that's a that's some low hanging fruit, Brian. I expect more from you. I expect more from you. Uh, but throughout yeah, these I, years, you should not expect more from me. Today is the uh, marks the the second straight week that I've been sick. I woke up in Kyoto two weeks ago today. Uh, sick. Yeah. Oh, sick on vacation is the worst. Yeah, it is, especially when like it's going to be like my first ever like very excited to eat the the cultural cuisine food. Oh my, food. Just, that was redundant, but I was so excited because Japanese food is by far and away my favorite food. I was so pumped, and uh, I couldn't did you ever... find Jiro? Did he dream of sushi? I did not, and oh. I was staying in Ginza for a couple of days too. There's a lot that I didn't do, and you know you're going to hear me blather about it on on the uh, the after disaster, but. You don't really know a place until you go to a place. And Japan, you know, you think you have an idea of what Japan is and until you get there. Uh, it's Give just... us the broad strokes. How long were you there for? Uh, how far did you traverse the country? That kind of stuff. Uh, I was there for nine nights, I guess, ultimately. And, uh, you know, it was a bit of an adventure getting over there. I had to, like, do a layover, unexpected layover in Hawaii for a night, which oh. Uh, was oh, for how was... a wife. <laughs> The wife went ahead, so Atticus and I were like at a little motel. Well, actually, that's not true. It was a little uh, Hyatt uh, in in uh, Waikiki for a night, which we were not expected to be at. And we got into Kyoto like a couple days late, but uh, all things said, I think I was there for eight nights or nine nights, and it was kind of like a fever dream. And like you think that Tokyo is giant, mm -hmm. and it is, mm -hmm. but you don't realize that it's pretty much like New York. The skyscrapers aren't you know as high as New York, but I mean there is just it's just buildings and commerce and stuff everywhere in Tokyo. And it's as wide and spread out as Los Angeles. Oh my. So, so it's like New York meets LA. It, it's like New York. It's a mix of New York and LA and it's just dust stop. And I never once even kind of got my bearings. Like it's just stuff. Like you think you see the, uh, the Tokyo tower numerous times. Cause there's just Tokyo looking towers all over the place. And it's the most culture shock I've ever had. And I've, you know, traveled. I've seen some things. I'm not like a world traveler, but I've been in a number You've of been around, yeah. Number of places. And I've I've never felt such a difference in in culture as I did. Um, pretty much boots on the ground. From the time I landed in Japan, it was just like, oh, things are much different over here. And I'm did still you... trying to figure out if they're much better. And I think that they are, but I'm not Interesting. sure. Interesting. I'm fascinated to hear more. Did you spend the majority of your time in Tokyo? um no so yeah we were in <laughs> oh my god uh we atticus and i traveled for about 20 hours ultimately uh Jesus. to get yoto so we landed in tokyo and then went straight to a subway and then straight on a bullet train to kyoto and i'm ignorant is that an hour is that five hours what is it's two and a half hours by bullet train which you know reaches speeds of 200 miles an hour so it's pretty far yeah and it used to be the old uh, capital of Japan. And that's uh, renowned as one of the prettiest cities in Japan, right? Yeah, it's where like a lot of the older stuff is. Oh, and that was what Oppenheimer, right in Oppenheimer, where the president was saying we can't bomb there because he and his wife had just gone on there for, yeah, it was for their honeymoon or something. Yeah. yeah. And by the time I went to sleep that night, uh, I had been awake for 24 hours. And the last thing I did was I received a uh, real estate phone call. Oh, God. I was talking to somebody who was looking for a, a place in Santa Clarita, and I'm like, uh, I'm in Japan right now, and I can help you when I get back. Um, and I looked at the clock. I'm like, I've been awake for 24 hours now. And then, I, you know, not surprisingly, I woke up sick. Um, but then we were in Kyoto for like three days, and then went back to Tokyo for a day, and then a couple days, and then uh, Nagano, and we went up and uh, stayed with the snow monkeys. And yeah, that were the Olympics, to, right? Back to, yeah, and back to Tokyo for a couple of days, and then... And then we left and a right. whirlwind. And I'm still kind of trying to, I've been home for five days and I'm still not sure exactly what happened. How was but, the onboard flight experience? Did you get to stretch out your legs or you cramped in coach? What, oh you... no, it was, it was, um, it was, I, I travel pretty well. I like to think that considering who I am, you would never guess, but like, mm -hmm. here was the situation coming home. Uh, 10 and a half hours. The flight was, I was with Atticus. Jillian was separated. She was sitting in a different aisle and we were in a row that had no uh, power. 
no, uh, the, the screens weren't working. <laughs> oh, <laughs> plug in our devices, and our devices were already kind of dead by the time we got it on the phone. Uh, uh, it was Atticus and I for 10 and a half hours with nothing to do but look at magazines and books and talk. And <laughs> how sweet. We made it. We made it. And then I got home and I just collapsed. I was kind of sick the whole time I was there. And Oof. then I got home and we got home at 2 p.m. on Friday and I collapsed in bed and I woke up at 1 p.m. on Saturday. Slept for 23 hours. But okay, so for those of you who don't listen after that, because I sounds go great. <laughs> but the biggest, the best, really sell it. The thing that really like struck me, the, the most striking thing that I saw the whole time I was there happened pretty early on. And I was uh, out on a busy street in Kyoto. Our hotel was connected to a subway. I mean, their mass transit is just, you know, unworldly. It's the best. Like you can go anywhere um, at a moment's notice. And, uh, there was a woman who rolled up on a bike and she had a little kid who was probably a little younger than Atticus. Atticus is seven. So her, her daughter was like six or seven years old and the kid was on the back of the bike and she parked the bike and she, the kid got off the bike with her little backpack on. Mom kissed her daughter, said goodbye, and the daughter just proceeded to disappear down into the subway to go off to oh. school by herself. And we live in a society where we don't, and this is true, we don't let our kids walk to school if it's like a block or two away I, yeah Atticus, ours is two and a half blocks and we wouldn't dream of it atticus goes to a school that's uh tk through eight and i don't see any kids walking to school or riding their bikes to school by themselves like eighth graders do not like it's just unheard of because we live in a society where the individuals come first and society comes second mm -hmm. and in japan it's the polar opposite it's all about societal needs over the individuals and you do feel that a bit as, a, as an american after a while with all of the rules and regulations and a lot of it isn't even law. It's just like considered rude to walk and eat hmm. or walk and drink. Like you can't have a coffee and walk down the street. You got to stop and drink that coffee. That kind of thing feels a bit oppressive after a little while. But I think ultimately the the, the safe society that I witnessed. Yeah, it was. Uh, sounds impressive. great. Did you view anything out there with cities or experiences or whatever through the lens of film? Like, oh, this is just like so-and-so or this reminds me of so-and-so. I, by mistake, uh, stumbled into the Kill Bill Sushi restaurant, nice. which I was not, I was not pleased That's with. It's hard to do because it's upstairs. I was, I mean, there's some stairs off the street, but I, I was looking for authentic Japanese, you know, sushi late at you night. Found it. The boy and the, and the daughter, you... the boy and the wife, well, actually, daughter, that's a, <laughs> oh, wow. boy, the son and the wife were uh, asleep. And I, I, like three different times, I was able to like, just go off into the city by myself and try and find like authentic sushi, late night sushi. And I was able to three times, but that was not one of the times because the only place that was open that was within walking distance was um, I realized as soon as I walked in, I'm like, oh, that's why they're playing like Bob Fogarty. John Fogarty. <laughs> but I got gotcha. you. Yeah. Wait, wait. You Sears. stumbled accidentally into the iconic sushi restaurant in Kill Bill. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was like the closest wow. one to the hotel we were staying at. And it was open late and uh, it was big enough that I did not need a reservation. So I'm like, cool, I'll make this work. And then I walked in, I'm like, oh no. And it was just nothing but whitey in there. Ironic because I imagine many Americans would probably seek that out or make it part of their trip. Oh, Brian you know, would have been all over it. I know. Yeah. I thought he, Brian, I took a picture. Uh, you know that thing that I just absolutely love finding the locations of movies that I'm obsessed with? Sure. And I, and I, I'll go there and I bask in like the guy. It's almost like a religious experience for the me. The famous I, five points example. Yeah, exactly. I walked like I think upwards of eighty plus blocks when I first set foot in New York to go to Five Points, which is absurd. And uh, I realized that 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 doesn't account for movies that I don't really care for because I did not <laughs> care for being in that. That's it was a really cool looking bar, sushi bar. And I do want to watch that scene again. But um, yeah, did I you would, get to use any of the toilets from Perfect Days? Every single it was almost like it's, it's like a state mandate that they all have to have those to the the toilets. Like uh, every single toilet, every we stayed at a inn that was built in 1911, and they had those futuristic toilet mm. seats. So yeah, that it's was ahead of their time. You know, you really got to stay in a place like Japan for I'd say a full month to get a feel for it. I still don't know if I had a feel for it. And it was I, I'm dying to go, man. I, I'll hit you up for info when the time comes. Highly recommend. Highly recommend. And it, what what a it's just a beautiful culture, beautiful people, and uh, very, very strikingly different from how we do things over here. And like I said, I've, I've seen a lot of stuff, and I've never seen something so different than the way that we go about things.
All right. On that note, we do have top five uh, movies uh, set in Japan coming up uh, in honor of Anderson's travels. But before then, it's been too long, Avery. What have the people seen? And let us know. In the interim, yes, the fan fiction compiled by Mike Cole. Andrew Martin on Facebook saw Godzilla Kong. That's how I've been told to say it. It's not Godzilla X Kong. You ignore the X. Godzilla Kong. The X New Empire. <laughs> everything with the Titans was amazing, but everything with the humans was straight garbage. Still would give this three out of five. Mm. Curtis Four on X saw Godzilla Kong the New Empire. A fun outing in the MonsterVerse. Keeping the humans to a minimum works well. It's entertaining, if not particularly deep. They set up the stakes and settings, and I had a good time just watching the monsters fight. I think they hit the mark well. Do we want to guess the score for Godzilla Kong, the FVT score? Sounds mostly faintly positive. I'll say 70. 80. 86. Ooh, how about that? Justin Wolfing on Facebook saw Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. The script go down, goes down so many different directions, and none of them seem really resolved. Mm -hmm. Takes forever to get to the payoff. There are too many characters. Whereas Afterlife had a heart. Frozen Empire is frozen to nostalgia. It had uh, chances to be better, but it played it safe for the film's uh, the first film's plot. It also stars Dickless William Atherton. That's true. And I, and I expecting Bill Murray to to say it, but he never did. Huge right. letdown. The film was disappointing, but uh, looking at the reviews early on, I knew what I was getting into. Afterlife was much better. Wait, Dickless, is that is that from like a previous movie? Remember or the original one, the uh, bureaucrat from the EPA, William Atherton, who yeah. was uh, Walter Peck. Yes, uh, and and Velmer uh, Venkman referred to him as Dickless over here. I for, I forgot, but yes, I guess uh, so. He reprised his role in this one, and he looked like a a, a wax statue. He he looked frozen in time. Yeah, while everyone else was moving around him. I've seen the film, and I will discuss. SLC Movie Junkie on X saw a pre-screening of Sting open wi opens wide on 412. The premise is a little absurd, but as someone that doesn't like spiders, it is very creepy. Like a super gory arachnophobia with a cast I've never seen, but they did a great job, and it had a little comedic relief throughout. Really enjoyed it. Okay. Dungeons and Dragon what? and Drago. Uh, on Instagram, saw Roadhouse 2024. I've heard, oh, no. heard good things. It was lacking the charismatic lead, all the Patrick Swayze, and had surprisingly less ass kicking than I expected. Connor McGregor can't act for shit, and the script didn't help either. All of the in jokes fell flat as Jake Gyllenhaal's performance. Hmm. Oh, no. I've heard other things. Okay, I've heard mostly poor, but I have not seen the film, so. Oh, this is this is fun. Adam Kaplan on Facebook saw the docu series "Quiet on Set: The Dark Side oh, of Kids yeah. TV" now streaming on Max. Another like really of working, fun experience. Uh, it was an out and out laugh riot. Couldn't stop laughing. You know uh, about the horrors <laughs> of working on Nickelodeon shows during their heyday. It was tough to watch, especially considering I loved many of those shows growing up. But riveting and informative. I'm glad the scumbags and child predators are being exposed for the horrible people that they are. Tell me the slime wasn't slime. Yeah, too, too soon. Uh, that's awful. Perilous Bashes on Reddit saw Late Night with the Devil. A fun 70s soaked horror flick with the dashes of Exorcist and Network. The ending was not uh, as batshit as I hoped, but still enjoyable. This may become a Halloween staple if enough people check it out. And oh. finally, finally, Charles Peterson, Peterson on Facebook also saw Late Night of, of the Devil or with the Devil. 70s aesthetic was great. And uh, Das Malchian is just a joy to watch on screen. Awesome movie. Likely would have enjoyed it more if it wasn't if I wasn't distracted by the man with his feet on the seat. We do live in a society, right? I emailed you guys a photo that <laughs> Charles Pedersen took uh, so you can react to that. I, I just sent that to you uh, uh, via email. Uh, it is egregious. You know where that would not happen? Japan. Would, would not happen in Japan. It, uh, that kind of bullshit. Look at that. Bare feet, too. Oh, Bare feet. Oh, with people. On people. top of the headrest. Since what COVID, gives? since COVID, people really believe the theaters are just an extension of their living room. They they really do feel to seem to feel this way. Uh, you if if you go to uh the 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 prime, I think it's the AMC, the prime of the Dolby, where they have the the reclining chairs. Mm -hmm. People now treat that like it is a bus stop. Oh, I yeah. I saw I saw D Dune. And one of the times someone got up to pee, multiple people got up to pee within the first 10 minutes in the theater, in the, th oh. <laughs> yeah, in the and it just Dude. didn't stop.
people were just constantly walking back and forth in front of the screen for three hours. Yeah, I saw something recently, and I sat in that first row, you know, like uh, down by where the, uh, the the handicap seats are, and it was like a freeway. It was just a constant oh, yeah. flow of people. You, it was like I was sitting on a city street just with people walking by. Yeah, you feel like you're late to catch a, a flight. You're like, should I, should I should I be getting my luggage? What's it? Do pe- why do people choose to sit in those first first rows, the little like down area be- be- beneath the uh, handicap seats? Row D or or A th- B C? Yeah, a, B, C is not a bad seat. C is not a bad row. Uh, I think B and A is pushing it, but C is not terrible. E and really? F are tight. That's the yeah. E is a e sweet spot. spot. You want e and do. F? Yeah. Oh, all right. Good to know. Well, it depends on which theater, but yeah, it's, sometimes it's D, but it's that row right above the uh, where you got the ground level row where people come in on the like the sidewalk area, and then the one right above that. Is yeah, you want to sit right behind the handicap uh, spots. And a Am lot I of these old because now, I prefer the back of the theater. I sit in the, one of the last two rows. Yeah, you're old. That's not the, even Atticus knows because I took him to uh, Ghostbusters this week, and we after we stayed for the entire credit sequence, and we were up in the top row, you know, putting our hands, which is just magical to him that we can put our <laughs> front of, in front of the projector right. and see our hands on the screen. And then we sat down in the top row, and I said, "What do you think's better, the, these up here or where we sat?" Which we sat in like you know row F or E, and he's like, "Oh, where we sat for sure." Yeah, I think unless you're going to make out with Christy, I don't think you want to sit in the back. Yeah, well, back rows are oh, good for me. I should have said that. Yeah, I should have cleared that up. Yeah. I mean, we get it. You got a young daughter. It's tough to get get alone time. That's no, true. The- yeah, we'll get it wherever we can. The longer the movie, the better. She, you know, we saw Dune. She remembers nothing. <laughs> Christy? That's right. Huh. Well, we saw Dune. Yeah, no, nothing. She doesn't remember anything related to the movie, at least. Wasn't that a Seinfeld bit where, like, they went to Schindler's, Schindler's List? list and, yeah. yeah, that's right. Gary was making out. Yeah, he got caught making out. And it, was a, it was a big uh, hubbub in the neighborhood. No one could believe it. Parents were very upset. Okay. Let's get to the flick fashion. Before I forget, I don't want to be derelict in my duty here. As they say, uh, here are upcoming listener assigned movies that we oh. will be watching. I have seen three of these four already. I wasn't able to see any of them um, while in Japan because they have it a lot. As far as Hulu is locked down, Prime locked down, HBO Max locked down. Uh, Netflix was the only thing that I could actually access over there. So I saw no movies the entire time I was in Japan. I would have gone to see Ghostbusters had it been available, but it came out a week later in Japan. Uh, I did take a couple pictures of the Japanese posters at the movie complexes over there of Godzilla and Ghostbusters, which I should probably send to you, Avery, so you can maybe put them in the post because that'd be kind of cool. Can you imagine wasting your time in the in Japan going to see Ghostbusters? Oh, if it was late night with the boy? Oh, God. Come on. I mean, it's that or like, you know, at the end of the day, you're sitting in the, in the hotel anyways. I mean, Oppenheimer just got cleared over there, so you could have seen that. That'd oh jeez, I don't want nothing. I, no, no, I don't want anything that'd be like to do watching that experience. Twelve Years a Slave, which I did in a predominantly black neighborhood, which was not an, an enjoyable experience for me. Yeah, you you could have hit for the cycle, um, okay. or in Africa. We were supposed to go to Hiroshima, but we did not make it because of the delays in our travel. But we were going to go see Hiroshima, uh, which will come up later on, on this program. I can tell you that. I'm I saw. I'm going to go highbrow with you, bri bri. I saw. I saw a film. I saw a film. Well, I was in the middle of uh, <laughs> so I'll get, we'll get there in one second. So, uh, DJ, DJ Tut has assigned us RMN, which is a, uh, a very interesting film, I'll say. Uh, it's on Hulu. Um, Stephen Morris, the one, the only Stephen Morris, has assigned us not one, but two. We're doing them back to back because it is a part one and a part two, 1986. A double feature called Jean de Florette and Manor of the Spring. They are both very highbrow movies. Um, they are connected, part one and part two. They're both French, and they are both only available on Criterion. Ooh, la, la. And I enjoyed the fuck out of those two movies. Oh, boy. Maybe, tell you, right. maybe I was in the right mind, uh, frame of mind because I have been deathly ill since I got back, laying in bed trying to re, um, recoup and, and watch these movies. They went down smooth, let me tell you. And then uh, finally, Anthony uh, Morfitt. I hope I'm saying that right. It, it, I, I would think it would be Moffat, but maybe it's Morfitt. Anthony. Anthony has assigned us Prince it's of It's got to be Moffat. Prince of Darkness. Prince of Darkness will be watched for Anthony here in the next few weeks. So those are our upcoming listener assignments as we catch up here. Yeah. If you want to be uh, one who assigns us a oh, film, just, jo- <laughs> just join up at our Patreon <laughs> under the uh, signer level and we will watch whatever you assign to us. Wouldn't we got to change. We got to change that somehow, Brian, because we're inundated and we have too many. And we can't be watching. You it's know, good 50- problem to have. Yeah. Oh, cool. all right. All right. 
want to open it up some more? Because right yeah, now we got. What if, you're, what if you're begging right now, like, "Hey, haven't seen a movie in six months from you guys. Uh, I really like you to uh, support the show." Well, what I'm saying is we're very behind. Or so I don't know if we. That's need to on be, us. We got to catch up. I, I think blame we need you. To change it to like you get one movie a year. How about that? For no. Oh yeah. Or you just pick a movie and you want us to talk about it, and then, you know you can write up like maybe a paragraph, and we'll we'll read about uh, what you think of the movie. Because we don't we we can't be watching like seventy five movie listener assignments a year. I yeah we just can't do that. It, it's benefited us in the years past. Our old best old new movies is populated, littered, if you will, with uh, listener assignments. And you wouldn't have seen your glorious Chinese propaganda without it. That's I, right. I'm not, that's that's our right. I'm not saying that it's not a great thing to do. I'm just saying that we got to temper it. I mean, we can't have we can't have you know upwards of seventy movies because we can't. Do you like to be assigned movies, Brad? Right. Do you like to assign uh, movies to me? I was assigned a movie this week. I know. And guess what? We're not going to be at Flick Festing this week, falling further behind on the listener assignments. Fair enough. Uh, is it time for us to. Uh, oh, uh, apparently our movies? producer's got a movie that he has seen. And I am, uh, I'm happy that he, he's done so because there is a black hole on this program and it is a horror black hole. And Oh, uh, don't, don't hurt Avery, though. Avery <laughs> is uh, filling that Classic. black hole. Classic of Pride Pride. I Classic saw Pride. Immaculate with Sidney Sweeney. 72% on Rotten Tomatoes, directed by Michael Mohan, written by Andrew LaBelle, starring Sidney Sweeney, Alvarado Morte, and Simone Tabasco. A lot of Italians, would you believe it? Uh, she's a nun of devout faith, and she goes to the Italian countryside uh, to become a young nun, and it becomes clear that uh, her new home harbors dark and horrifying secrets. Oh, dear. It's a scant hour and 29 minutes, the sub-90-minute movie. Even still, it felt uh, a little <laughs> long at times. Felt a little long at times. The, the Starting with the good, the score was fantastic. Really, really liked the score. Really liked the production and the costuming. Uh, oh, wow. This is damning a fate praise. There's skull trauma. There's some uh, graphic skull trauma, not once but oh, twice. Fun. And when a movie does that, when they're not afraid to pull punches with the skull trauma when you don't need it, uh, it's a little upsetting that at the climax, when you're hoping to see something, you don't, and it's left to your imagination. Felt like a bit of a cop out. Felt like a bit of uh, mm -hmm. a little bit of bullshit there. Uh, uh -huh. Sydney Sweeney is oh, Jesus. a mixed bag. I feel like my, my friend said it best, where she is kind of terrible at the small moments, but in the big moments, she's fantastic. So she's that's very, where she's, she's like very talk famous for some reason. Who is this person? She's in Euphoria. She's in White Lotus. Uh, she was uh, most recently Madam Web, and where she was kind of wasted, uh, and on SNL, where apparently her boobs ended wokeness. Oh, fun! A uh, lot of lot of kind of non nudity in this. So if that moves the needle for you, it wasn't all that. <laughs> it wasn't all that that scary. Um, but yeah, Sydney Sweeney, like like in a scene where she's talking about her passport, laughably bad. But mm. then in moments where she's fearing for her life or. Um, giving birth to uh, potentially a, a, a creation of the Lord, uh, exceptionally believable. I don't know if I will. See, you can see a more accurate uh, depiction of what it would be like to see someone give birth, uh, other than seeing someone give birth. So it's very odd. Or she is a, a real mixed bag there in terms of her range and believability. But uh, I've seen this uh, someone give birth, so I'll compare and contrast. Yeah, you could see it and tell her uh, if she did a better job than Christy. But uh, it wasn't Christy. Uh, Giving, <laughs> giving birth to the bishop spawn, uh, but I don't know. I don't know if I liked this movie. I'm still thinking about it, which I think is normally a good sign. It hasn't. Le it hasn't left me. It wasn't in one eye out the other. Uh, I don't really know who this is for. If you're not a horror fan, I don't think there's any reason to see this, uh, other than to fuck with your relatives on Easter, which is now past. Uh, no. But yeah, I think if you like horror, there's there's something here. I don't think you need to see this in theaters. I think I think if you're looking for something on streaming and you're you're uh, do for some horror, go for that. But other than that, I, I can't really give it a strong recommend in theaters. But the score is tied. I would check that out if it's uh, streaming anywhere. It's a it's a fun time. All right, very good. Or if you like nun boobs, that's another that's another recommend. That's another strong yeah. Checking the uh, pro column. All right, Anderson, did you watch any movies on the plane? Yeah, I did. Thank God. I watched one that I, I liked very, very much that we missed from last year, and uh, I'll get to Dick's the musical later. But in the meantime, let's talk about the big, the sexy. Uh, we're a week behind on Ghostbusters, and then we can also do King, I mean, uh, Godzilla Kong here. So let's get so you saw Ghostbusters, yeah? Yeah. Nice. Ghostbusters, Frozen Empire. It, Frozen Kingdom? Frozen Empire? I didn't write it down. I'm stupid. You know, both the big 
ten pole movies that are out this week are yeah. empires and King Kong. It's like, do they do they all pull from the same name bank? And they're all like, they're they're restricted to like ten names. But yeah, both of the- <laughs> everything was dark. Dark was in every single you know uh, what it was. What what is the name of the t- when the title is like Transformers colon dark yeah, yeah, the subtitle the subtitle yeah what why why do they all do the same bullshit oh and both empires were frozen as well a lot of strange crossover yeah with freezing and frozenness and failed jokes <laughs> hey, Ghostbuster oh. frozen empire is uh 2024 i should have wrote that down it's in 2023 look at me 2024 film directed by gil keenan uh keenan keenan i'm saying keenan uh starring McKenna Grace, Paul Rudd, Carrie Coon, Finn Wolfhard, Kumail Nanjiani, Dan Aykroyd, Emily Emily Allen Lind, I'm, I'm assuming, Paul, Paul, Patton Oswalt, Ernie Hudson, William Atherton, the aforementioned, and Bill Murray. Just 44% of Rotten Tomatoes. She was low. Feels about right. Uh, this is in theaters now. Anderson, how did you, did you sprint back from your trip to see this? Well, you know, Atticus is a big Ghostbusters kid. Uh, I we all love the Ghostbusters, and uh, we're always excited to to see a new iteration of Ghostbusters. So, uh, yeah, we were looking forward to this one. I knew that it wasn't going to to change my life uh, in any way. Uh, I knew, you know, you go into a movie like this realizing that it's a giant, giant production with a whole lot of money and a giant budget, uh, marketing budget, and they need a target audience. And I'm sure that a lot of thought went into who is this movie for. And I think that what they landed on was it's for parents who saw the original in 1984 and the subsequent sequels and now have children of age that would want to go see that. So that's me mm. and Atticus. And for, for, if that's their aim, I think that they came pretty close to, you know, hitting the mark and uh, there was enough there for me to enjoy. And uh, Atticus definitely, you know, was his mind was blown at times with some of the effects and um, really some of the, yeah. And uh, ultimately, uh, I'd say that one out of four jokes works. I think the Kamel stuff was great. I really liked him. He really, mm-hmm. but the most of the cast, I could not, I just don't care for. I just, I don't like the, like the, the, the daughter. She just does nothing for me at all. How, how's your boy podcast? Podcast is the worst name <laughs> still for sure. Without, without a doubt, the, the worst character name ever given in any, any movie. And uh, it's, it's a bunch of like it's that it's that brand of it's almost like an offshoot of Wes Anderson, like spindly, nebbish, like we're funny and we're sarcastic and we're, you know, we're like we're outside society, but we're smarter than all of you. It's almost like mm-hmm. looking down their nose at you type like the Wolf Hearts character. It's just like, okay. fuck, fuck, let's fuck, let's back up know? a second, because I want to uh, jump on something you said earlier, which is who is this movie for? So problem one, this movie is fairly dull this movie is really kind of boring and not interesting well it followed, two, it followed all of the tent pole i followed all of the uh, tropes and every you know it was it was very paint by numbers like just like the other yeah. ones right? it's always going to be some kind of major god at the end and uh you know you have the same like heroes but then different foes at the end and that's one thing that avengers does is they bring back and, and dc a lot of the comic book stuff they'll bring back the same foes because they're some of the best characters right whereas like movies like those <laughs> What in the world? Oh, they're testing the goddamn fire alarm. I'll mute myself. You You shouldn't be unmuted anyway. (laughs) That's a good point. This is my punishment. Movies movies like Ghostbusters, like you'll just get, you know, each iteration will have a different, like, uh, uh, nemesis, right? And sure, that was the strength of those original movies was the the bad guys, the villains, the assorted cast of villainous characters was interesting slash iconic. Like those are those are embedded in the, in the movie history. This one was boring. I don't remember the villain at all. He had horns. He had horns, and he was he was frozen, and he was a god from ancient times. And I kind of liked some of the some of the the lore and the origin of mm. like where he came from and and all that. And I liked some of the effects and some of the practical effects. Again, were good. Uh, but it just felt obligatory and they were on to something. I, I maybe you'll agree with me with this, Brian. But so here we are all these years later, you know, 1984 is when they started putting the ghosts in this this chamber down in the basement of the firehouse. And they've been doing it for so long that it's getting full now. And that's a real problem. Yes. And that 
could have been the entire yes, premise of I the agree. movie. I agree. And how are we going to, you know, transfer? I kept waiting for that to pay off. Like, oh, shit, I'd rather see a thousand ghosts. And that was just giving us runways so we could get to the, the main boss at the end of the movie, which I think inherently was the problem. Now, without the main boss, we wouldn't have had the Fire King, who was Kamel, who I think really brought all of the comedy to the movie. Without him, there's zero comedy in this movie for me. Without him, this movie is, is, is uh, as it is, it's a very tough recommend and without him I, there, there's no reason at all to be interested in this i mean I, I i won't go as far as you're going saying that i was bored but there's there were missed opportunities like how 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 many of the old ghosts i mean you want to go after member berries without being lazy and just having fucking slimer in the attic of the of the firehouse under a pile of wrappers it's just like that's so lazy i agree and, and okay so i'm glad you mentioned that because bringing your first point full circle to this point i would not i'm so the movie was to me so boring the it's a bad sign when you find yourself thinking of other things and thinking about the making of the film while you're watching the movie so i'm 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 convinced this movie stick with what do you think of this premise i think this movie tested very poorly amongst audiences and then like it wasn't nearly fun enough it was very bleak and boring and dark frankly they added the brother slash slimer storyline at the end in like reshoots because if you watch the movie it has no connection practically the rest of the story it just exists as the standalone member bear like you said where oh hey it's slimer i know him hey he's back some wacky okay back to the story no, I mean I haven't done the research to see if they did. I haven't either. I'm I'm totally I, guessing. I don't think so. I think Slimer is just obligatory. I think they're like we didn't really have a much Slimer in the last one. We tried to reinvent him with Muncher, and let's uh, make sure that we have Slimer in here. I I could see exact same. I don't care what he does. He just has to be in there. He has to slime someone at least three times. Mm. What people expect, what they want. That's plausible. Uh, but you know, Paul Rudd was okay in it uh i didn't you know the wife doesn't I, I, it just it doesn't seem like it was that well cast and but you know that's uninspi it. uninspired it, it did feel it, it felt the entire movie felt like obligatory like hey this is a cash grab we can easily get a bunch of people in here because of the things that i said like you know the the generation that saw it originally when they were kids and now they have kids themselves and ghostbusters continues to you know give life to generation after generation so i just i just wish that it was a little more inspired and uh but ultimately Here. I, you know, we we were both entertained, and I found myself laughing at a lot of the stuff. Both me, you, you and Atticus. Yeah, Atticus I and I. Were, I thought you were was... speaking for me. I'm like, I was not very entertained. <laughs> <laughs> it was fine. Uh, however, when the movie was over, I said, "Buddy, let's go into the Prime Theater next door, and I'll give you a, a quick little peek at what Godzilla and King Kong are doing." Oh yeah. my! Yeah. <laughs> so we went and we went up the dark hallway, and we peeked around the uh the corner and we watched and it was kind of a perfect spot for him to just kind of get a taste because it was where king kong and godzilla finally come together and there's just no dialogue <laughs> it's just screaming and roaring for yes. like two full minutes <laughs> there's no explanation for the bodies that are flying off the fucking pyramids and keys uh, oh jesus <laughs> and uh now atticus is Highly obsessed with the idea of being able to go see that. So I'm using Fuck that. yes. Uh, if he gets 100% on his practice test at home with us for a spelling test this week, I will take him to that sometime next week. So <laughs> Anderson's in the background really wanting to go, being like, oh, so I before he. Can I tell you something? I kind of am. I kind of am. I'm really hoping that he gets 100%. <laughs> I'm going to push him harder than I probably would otherwise. Uh, I do want to experience uh, Godzilla Kong with him. So you've seen Godzilla Kong? Oh, yeah. All right, talk about that, because I have not seen that. I got to tell you, uh, not since Wonka has a trailer led me astray so harshly. Okay, good, because I have not been inspired to see this. Very fun. Very fun. I on the fun scale. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of everything. Now, there was, and maybe it's because I'm sick. But there was a moment where I looked down and I'm like, how are they going to wrap this all up in the next 20 minutes? I looked at my watch and I'm like, oh, my God, the movie's not even half over. So it doesn't fly by, I want to say. And it is two movies in one because it's tracking Kong, what he's doing. And then do you have like the director or any information on this? 
No, I'll let uh, Avery do that if he wants to. If you have that in front of you, Avery. I, I Why are we that. encouraging him to talk? Wing guard, because I want to hear that sweet alarm. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> you want to hear it sound like I'm getting bleeped? Uh, yeah, I could I could pull it up. If yeah, Godzilla call it, directed by Adam Wingard, who had the three writers, which is always a good sign, uh, starring Rebecca Hall, Brian Tyree Henry, fucking paper boy. Yeah, and but Dan awful. Stevens. Awful. He should have been called podcast. He could have been. That cat was <laughs> another one of those archetype uh, characters. It was just like, well, yes, we get it. He's of the modern world, and he likes social media. Yeah, and, and, he, he, and he's vibing. Yeah. Uh, uh, Thank God they limited. I mean, the smartest thing about this movie is uh, the worst part about these movies is always the people, the people. And they limit that to like 12 minutes at the front. And then they go, who cares? It's the hollow earth. We don't need to explain this to you. Here's how long, is this, how long is this script? Like 55 pages? Oh, Christ. It's a two hour. Uh, it's a two hour movie. Yeah, but there's no dialogue. Sounds I'd say about like- half the movie is just monster stuff. Yeah. And, uh, and maybe maybe a little bit more. And then the other stuff is just the people trying to push the story forward with it's just sweet 80s montages. Absurdly, uh, needlessly, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, what's what's what, what do you say all the time? Needless Elaborate. Right. The, the writing is terrible. Here's an example oh. of of the writing. The, the writing, God. I mean, you see this in the trailer, but Kong gets his arm injured, and they're, they're like, "Well, we need him to help defeat the the final monster. He's hurt. Okay, why don't we do project like Thunder Fist? They go, "What is that? Yeah. We made a prototype of this fist for him to use, but they said it was too much. Fortunately." It's already been made. They pulled the plug right the here, <laughs> right after it was done. It's, <laughs> it's already oh, outfitted Christ. to. It's already outfitted to cure a uh, 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 frostbite, which they could yes. not have been coming. Yes. They, they put they put the glo- the glove on him. It injects him with this this green goo, and they go, "Yes, that is fixed as is his frostbite." Oh, this movie is so dumb that it felt like it should have been animated most most of the time. I'm yes. like, how is this not a cartoon? It is so the whole the whole all the writing was just to get King Kong and Godzilla together. That's the entire the the like 90 percent of the movie is them in different parts of the world. And, you know, they're coming together because you've seen the poster and you know what the title of the fucking movie is. And it's them just living in different okay. parts of the world. My interest, my interest is wavering. Well, well what's the, good about this? the movie shines? I, I, I think you'll agree with me, Anderson. All this stuff with Kong. Kong with Baby Kong. Kong is fantastic. Okay, yes, the movie. I, I'm I'm somewhat entertained, and I'm a I'm a creature guy. I love the big creatures, and Kong really does have pizzazz and charisma. Like he, they do a really good job with selling you on Kong being the good guy. Godzilla, not so much. Godzilla's got some comedy though, because he's sleeping like in the Coliseum. Like that's his little place where he goes and rests after he fights these giant titans. And the, the, the Italians are all pissed. They're like, he can't be sleeping in our Coliseum. And they're like, what are you gonna do? Like he's saving your city. And but um when Kong finally finds the other <laughs> giant monkeys in Hollow Earth. Sure. In between it, Kaiju baths, he goes to sleep in the Coliseum. Yeah, he goes through that. Gets, he curls up and it's like his little like a doggy bed, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. he curls when, up. When Kong finds this this enslaved uh, uh, colony of large, like King Kong like apes in Hollow Earth that he didn't know existed, and the rivalry begins between between him and the the big red like rope a dope guy. That's what the movie <laughs> really does. <laughs> life. It's it's uh it's. It's like dialogue free uh rise of the planet of the apes shit. Right. And you're, you're you're in. You're invested in like who's going to win and fuck these guys and and the way they fight is great. It's very visceral and I love that they immediately subvert cuz you've seen baby King Kong in the in the trailer and you think okay, what's this cutesy schmaltzy bullshit yeah. going to be? The, the minute you see him extent. the minute you see him he bites King Kong's hand and lures him into an ambush and King Kong responds by picking him up by the leg and using him as a weapon to beat the shit out of other larger monkeys and then right. throw him off the screen. <laughs> he's like, using my, him my, my is growing. Yeah, he's, he has not just... he's the equivalent. Like, you know, like uh, there's like, you know, groups like, you know, like bully kids and they always have that one little shit that like, you know, he couldn't fight at all. Yeah, but, like, Grover you know, Dill. Like, or, or the runner when there's they're doing a gang movie. There's like the ten year old kid who's the runner and he, he's luring yeah. into the the ambush. You hate this little fucking monkey, and you're supposed to turn a corner on him, but I still hated him all the way through. Avery, I don't know if, if you ever <laughs> corner. He but had I a great, great, great uh, scene at the end, though. 
Oh, great. And him in slow motion doing a flip. Fantastic. There's, there's what's funny. Cause all the dialogue in this movie that was supposed to be funny, mainly by Tyrese, like, it's just not, it's not yeah. funny. At all. None of it was like, I was just rolling my eyes and like put off by the would be comedy, but there were a, like probably a half a dozen great visual jokes where I was laughing out loud at King Kong. Like there's one where like an ape comes up and, and it gets in his face and he's just talking all this shit. And then just smash cut to King Kong, uh, his uh, effect of just smashing him right in the face. <laughs> just, just, him flying. Just, just, just Tyson's him. Just knocks. Like, there's a there, there, there's a big battle going on, and one of the apes who's trying to to kill King Kong for unknown reasons is about to like go off the cliff, and they have that tropey thing where King Kong saves him though. He saves his enemy. He pulls him back up, saves his life, and the the monkey's like, well, "Why'd you?" The ape's like, why'd you, why'd you do that and for a moment? And then immediately starts to try to kill Kong. Tries Kong. to stab him with a knife. So he just pushes him off the cliff. I'm like, all right, I gave you a chance. Laugh out loud shit. Yeah, the, the red monkey is, is just comically evil. Where it's it, so it, evil. So evil. It, it, oh, God damn. Oh, wow. This. Wow, we got tsunami. I hope or... the building burns down. Uh, the, he's laughing yeah, Are you evil. in Taiwan? <laughs> you see, you see the like what's presumably the little monkey's like uncle or his surrogate dad, and he's like, "Oh, I'm so glad you're safe, son." And immediately the red monkey just <laughs> drop kicks him into the lava the and he lava. burns to death. Yeah, he is. He's a comically evil villain, and uh, I, he was quite enjoyable. Uh, uh, I, yeah, I I liked it way more than I thought I would. I'm hoping to be able to bring out it because now, ten years ago, there's no way I have time for this movie. No. I, this is the dad me talking. This is Avery's young, you know, childhood coming up. Into oh yeah, I, I felt like a ten year old boy. It's ext- the way I described it was it's it's very stupid, but it's it's very fun. And I, there's a lot. To, I don't I don't know if any of the eight percent needs to see this stupid fucking movie, but I think if if I think this will appeal to many men. And if you have what like an eight to fourteen year old boy at home, take them to see this movie in theaters. It is high on the fun scale. All right, I, I'm tempted at this point to to dip my toe into a Godzilla X Kong. Hey, Tessa might have some fun. There's some strong female leads in this. You just said eight percent doesn't need to ever see it. I, I retracted it. Tessa doesn't listen. She's not part of the eight percent. There's some there's some missed opportunities for sure. Uh, as far as like you know, get, getting that like oh fuck yeah moment when Kong and and Godzilla team up. Like I yeah I didn't feel that at all. Did not care. Uh, they did a decent job at you know making you feel the scope of how large these things are at times, and then other times like Mothra could have been the size of an actual moth. Like I, I couldn't really tell. I didn't feel her. Yeah. Uh, and at times it felt like the baby monkey was bigger than King Kong. If they had some, I kind of wish that they had dimes around them at all times for scale. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there was a lot of scale issues with uh, palm trees getting smashed by you know pinky toes. But uh, quite often, I'm like, are these things even big anymore? I'm having a hard time telling. Because it really did feel like uh, Planet of the Apes uh, there for a while, for a large chunk of the movie, which was the best part of the movie. But the grandeur wasn't even there. It, uh. it, it, it had one of the clunkiest smash cuts I've ever seen where they transitioned to the final city for the final battle. <laughs> Just the biggest tonal shift. <laughs> well, are you talking about the Gibraltar? No, no, no. Where they go in there, there's the, the like the they're like at the height of this battle and they're playing the intense music and monkeys are punching each other and Godzilla's shooting fire and then they fall through this portal. Yeah. Hold on. Okay, it's done. Uh, and then they fall through this portal to go back to the top side and you go, okay, where are they going to end up? It's still going to be intense. And it's a smash cut to Rio de Janeiro. And it's like, oh, but yeah. da, 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 da. <laughs> and it's for like uh, two minutes, they're just showing just, just women in bikinis People just dancing them. and it's playing ball. It's the most Rio de Janeiro. <laughs> it's like the it's, 80s Rio that we grew up with. It's not like the actual Rio that we kind of know of now, right? Yeah, it's, it's like the way they introduce a city in Fast and Furious, where it's just so... <laughs> <laughs> and the amount of the amount of so a lot of creatures get killed on screen here. The amount of human beings that die in this in this movie, Brian, tens of thousands oh. of dead human beings, but you don't see one. You don't see no. one. But you know they're in the buildings that are being sure. and King Kong is supposed to be like they set it up. I think they even say it in the trailer, like right? he is supposed to be like the protector of humanity. Meanwhile, he's just like using full fucking skyscrapers as weapons against <laughs> yeah. other monkeys. What you know that they're inhabited, you know that there's thousands of people. Being killed. Uh, Even if it's on a weekend, those things are uh, death traps. High on the fun scale. Yeah. Enjoyable. God's like half of Godzilla and half half of, uh, there's there's like a a perfect fun movie uh, across section of uh, uh, Ghostbusters and Godzilla. 
Kong. And there's also like just the worst movie I've ever seen, Cross Section, in those two. <laughs> yeah. Yes, but it's yeah. hard not to marry the two of them, and there's a lot of similarities. I'm curious. I don't know how much you get out of it, Bright. Honestly, there's a lot well, of ball shaming. It's fun, you, dumb fun. That's my that's my sweet spot. You pick up on the bald shaming going on in that movie, like oh, all I don't the like, I don't like this. balding I don't for like, sure. I don't like that. All about bald. The the, the bad apes were like uh, missing thinning hair or bald altogether. <laughs> yeah, like, there wasn't as, still not as much bald shaming as in Dune, or that was just the mark of evil. Well, I mean, they were supposed that's to be right. not skinheads, hairless. All right, all right. Choice. I saw a very different film. Should we take a quick break? Are we taking a break? Yeah, let's take cool. a break. It's been a while. Let's take a break. Coming up next, uh, more confessions after this. All right, we're back. I saw a uh, very uh, different film from what you described. I can't say that uh, Best Darden is uh, different than Kong oh. Godzilla, but uh, based on what you described, Best Darden, aka The Promised Land, is a very different movie. 2023 film. Oh, yeah. I assigned it. Assigned to me by uh, yours truly, Anderson. Uh, the Promised Land is directed by Nicola uh, Arcel. It is a Danish film. Uh, it is uh, starring Matt Mickelson, Amanda Collin, and Simon uh, Benever, Benneberg, Benneberg, uh, 96%. On Rotten Tomatoes, you can rent this to watch it like I did. Uh, this was Denmark's official submission to the Oscars. Did not get nominated did for not. Best International Feature. Uh, Anderson, imagine my delight and surprise when I fired this up on Amazon and it defaulted to a dubbed version. Oh, yes, dubbed in English. Did you, you do that? Now, it was actually quite distracting because it was very bad dubbing, like along the lines of like uh, the battle at uh, Chongjin Lake, which we saw, or Lake so, Chongjin. Thank God. Thank uh, it's very bad dubbing. Per- You've so grown I got, a lot of the person over the last few years, and I, I would like to acknowledge that. His hand got, was trembling uh, as he was switching off the I subtitles. Know, <laughs> I'm like, I can't believe I'm doing this. We're all sign of the times. But I, I, I switched it back to the original Danish with subtitles. Because I, I think thought, that even if it was a good dub, Brian, I think that it would ruin the impact of a movie like this. I do. It's, it, it was a bad dub. I got like 10 seconds in. I'm like, oh, no, this is this is comically bad. So uh, uh, subtitles are what? There's how I recommend everyone watch this. And I do recommend everyone watch this. This is a really good movie. So give us – you didn't flick fast this properly. Give us your uh, thoughts on uh, well, starting. Because I didn't cover it until uh, we did The Vaulties, and it was in my top 10. So that's mm. where I get, I get a, a bit of a flick fashion. Uh, but what uh, my main – my main take on it at the time was that all of the things that I did not feel in Dune too, I felt in the promised land mm. with story arcs and character uh, motivations and like and stakes decisions right. and stakes and my, so I think you did a good job of setting this up. It's in the 1700s uh, in Denmark post war. Uh, Mads Mikkelsen is a decommissioned uh, captain. Real quick. The- Isn't everything post war? I mean, all the time, everywhere at every, <laughs> Point in human history, Godzilla Kong is, yeah. But so he's low man on the totem pole. Uh, yeah, he's a, a go ahead. You're doing a much better job. He's a decommissioned captain from their uh, military, uh, and he has uh, been as a, uh, as a uh, I guess, uh, thank you for your service. You've been given a small pension, and he takes that. And he and we open up with him going to like the local board and saying, Hey, uh, this land that is just kind of out there and doing nothing uh unharvestable unharvestable land yeah the heathen uh or is that what it's called the The heath the heath Heath. that's it he goes i want to cultivate this land uh here's my money and uh, i want to do my best to cultivate this land and they're like uh well you're crazy but uh thank the the king will be thrilled that uh, someone is paying attention to this otherwise godforsaken land so uh, yes knock yourself out uh, and they all laugh at him and they all laugh and say yeah. he's never going to succeed no one's ever been able to grow anything out there it's frozen and it's like oh, depleted soil and what a waste of time let him go out and try and die who cares yep laugh. uh the the uh Ace up a sleeve, we find out uh, a little bit later in the movie. He wants to grow potatoes, which grow well in the cold ground, underground, in most any condition except for frost. And he's like, can do. I brought these up from Germany, from my uh, uh, war efforts, and uh, I will plant these and uh, we'll harvest potatoes. You know what else um, is up his sleeve, Brian? What's that? You know what else is up his sleeve? Work ethic. 
This man, yeah, love, love and elbow grease. Ethic, my God. The man uh, rises and, and sets with the sun. He uh, yes. work all day and uh, take whatever motley crew he can get to follow. And he is the uh, personality to go with it. Not not a guy I'd like to be around. Indeed, no, it was I, like- I, I get the the sense that he likes solitude. Hour and ten minutes in the movie, I'm like, I don't think he smiled. I don't think he smirked. <laughs> no. an, an ounce of joy he was, has come out of this man. Like what Dude, drops him? Two two hours into the movie, i.e., when the final credits rolled, I don't think he smiled once, including the uh, very awkward sex scene. That's not true. Like he died. He, there's definitely a, an arc here, and you see us offside for sure, which is, which is, I think, the entire point of the movie, right? Also, so he, that he so the movie the really human. gets. Uh, Really gets real. He it's fun, interesting and fun to watch Mads, you know, doggedly try to tame this wilderness. But the movie really gets rolling when mm. uh, uh, Schinkel, aka the Schinkel, uh, comes on the scene, and uh, he is the local, I guess we would say, landlord, Lord, yeah. Lord of the land, uh, mm-hmm. who uh, Mads ultimately. They, there's some dispute either does or does not have to answer to like Mads is like, I answer to the King and he's like, no, he answered to me. And there's obviously friction. Um, uh, the Schinkel, uh, I call him that because his last name is Schinkel, but he is not, he doesn't think that's worthy enough. So he wants to go by a more regal sounding name. So he starts calling himself the Schinkel, which is a, a running gag throughout the film where like people are calling him, Hey, Schinkel, listen up. And he's like, the Schinkel. He's all yeah. He's always correcting them, which reminded me of in in groupers. I wrote that for the uh, the one detestable character, Oren. Everyone calls him Aaron, and like that tells you a lot. And that kind of goes back to like early Love Line days, where Corolla would give people shit for correcting uh, their name. And it's like we're gonna talk to you one time. Just let us call you, you know, Tara yeah. instead of Tara. It doesn't matter if we're gonna be. Uh, anyways, yeah. It, I think it's a the sign- example you just used was an employee. Yeah, well, I mean, he would do that on phone calls as well, but. It's just, I think it's usually the sign of a, a um, wholly important person or they, somebody who feels that their importance is more. a chip on their shoulder for sure. Yeah. My dad did it all the time when, when they, you know, like they'd say Cohen party of four and he'd have to go correct them and say, like, my, my last name's Cowan. And it's like, who fucking cares dad? Yeah. We're never going to see that host again. You know what I mean? You're not that important. Like, it was a transactional relationship at best. Right. So, so uh, Dushinkel is uh it is a uh, man who has some power for sure, but uh, is afraid of losing it and uh, would like more. And uh, I, I don't want to give too much away. The movie sort of takes off from there. One more time for the beautiful girls. This is one you're, of you're, the you're losing time. them. You're, no, you're losing uh, them. Avery, I'm glad you said you're losing that them, because sir. <laughs> I'm glad you said that because I, I, I remember he does. He doesn't say that, that the assist at one point, um, the shingle is, Doing something in front of a crowd that the crowd is not uh, buying into. Receptive, not receptive. And, uh, Most crowds would not. His trusted, uh, Dushinkel's trusted assistant, uh, his confidence, Constance, his consigliere, comes up to him and whispers in his ear, the crowd is not with you, sir. <laughs> he doesn't, he can't uh, understand why uh, not everyone is as, as is as uh, uh, just soulless and uh, <laughs> yeah. as much of a, uh, it's like it's like brian doing better with bean how dare you he's a classic sociopath he's a classic sociopath this is uh, about classes as well uh because you know he is from the high order and uh we got our boy mads who's from like the lower order and and he's much young he's a much younger man he's probably what like 30 and mads is is, is, his 50s yeah Yeah. and he's a bit of a fancy boy you know he's he's drinking wine and like he's in like pompous clothes and and, 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 then slapping asses and drinking wine and yeah Yeah. wearing wigs fucking whoever he wants because you got the impression i got the impression that he was bored and thus when mads came into his purview he was like oh finally someone to to lord over someone to fuck with yeah an adversary that i can you know toil with uh he was one of the better written cartoonish at times but i don't care he was fucking he he was very enjoyable to hate not no no, yes you're absolutely right not just that he was a great, uh, we did Top 5 Weasels uh, a while back, and it got me thinking. Uh, it was been nine years, Anderson. We should update our list of Top 5 Weasels for uh, Patreon. Okay. All right. At some point soon, because it's a good list, and uh, it reminded me of this character. Like, yeah, he's very Weasley. I I really enjoyed uh, the the dynamic the two brought. It was, it you know, reminiscent of, 
uh, reminiscent of uh, uh, There Will Be Blood as far as tone and, you know, the foes, obviously very different with, with Eli and, uh, and uh, I'm drawing a blank on the name. My brain is not working properly. Our boys from uh, Daniel, DDL. Daniel Plainview. Fuck. But yeah, the, that that kind of butting the heads and just the work ethic and just a, a constant attrition and uh, yeah, it's there, there's something there. There's some fibers to be uh, melded uh, to to be shared. I think with there will be fair more. enough. Anyway, good assignment, solid. Thank you for assigning this to me. Worthy of a top ten, you'd say, 2023. Top ten, yeah, uh, that that's definitely it. Would be on the short list for top five. Yeah, this is a, a solid movie. I was a little, I was a little concerned that maybe it was some recency bias, but I, you know, I don't, I don't think it was. I, that movie really hit me hard, especially at the time. You know, it came kind of came perfect because I was going on and on about how I just didn't care, uh, feel anything with Dune with the characters, and then this one, I felt a lot. Mm. I, there was a lot of like, you know, fist pumping moments, which I feel ashamed of while I'm doing them. But I mean, it's really, you know, a testament to how the filmmakers are making me feel something. I don't enjoy just torture scenes that much. <laughs> And I feel like also it had been just long enough where you started to miss Mads Mickelson. You're like, ah, I could, I could use a hit of Mads, and then he's great in this. One of these a year, I guess. He does one Danish film a year, apparently. Like that's kind of like in his own contract to keep the Danish film scene alive. Or this relevant. also had the right amount of uh, uh, humor and, and and drama. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like this could have been too far either way. Yeah, and just when it starts, you're right. It's got a great rhythm to it, kind of like Riders of Justice, and it's the same. Uh, the director who wrote the story for Writers of Justice, and it just when it starts to become kind of a slog and a little bit too much, like it'll bring you back up. It's like it's constantly bringing you up, down, up, down. It was just a really well uh, con constructed film. I love it. The Promised yeah. Land, Bastarden, Bastarden, yeah. working title, or actually, that's the, I think that's the title over Danish there. title, yeah. Uh... Still, still Danish, I think they, they get off scot free. I, my time in Copenhagen last year, um. Uh, they they do not suffer uh, Westerner Americans. Uh, they, oh. they're probably ruder than the French uh, as far really? as really. Uh, they do. They really do believe they're superior. I was just hanging people. out with some Danish people over the weekend. Oh yeah, out here yeah. or the homeland in Arizona of all places. What I uh, what I felt while I was over there, and you know, I was only there for like three or four days, but I really felt like they are still the ruling empire, and oh, they they will retake their their reign, the rightful place. Yes, that's that's what it felt like. A do you have more films? Do you have more films to talk about? Yeah, I do. Uh, I got Dex the musical. Ooh, I got a I got a documentary that uh, you might actually be interested in. Uh, what do you want to do first? I want to hear about Dex. All right, Dex the musical, twenty twenty three film, <laughs> uh, directed by the one, the only Larry Charles, based on a uh, cult, uh, very uh, fondly um, supported. Uh, stage musical uh, by Aaron Jackson and Josh Sharp. I was not familiar with either one of these uh, lads. And uh, I, do you know what do you know about Dix? Very little. I'm looking at it. Marketed right as the first A24 musical. And I had heard some kind of review of it when it came out last year. And it was kind of, it wasn't a great review. And it just pretty much talked about how profane. Mm. Uh, and over the top the movie is which it absolutely is which you would expect from larry charles uh director and, of borat director of borat and uh a lot of larry david stuff seinfeld um but what this <laughs> what this movie is is exactly that it is disgusting filthy it's over the top with uh, so it's a gay musical and it's very uh self-aware and uh aaron jackson and josh sharp it's got this the type of tone of, of humor that you would expect from south park and everyone loved that book of mormon so much and i think it was kind of oversold by the time i actually saw it jillian took me to it years ago i liked it but it, it was like okay this you know i i've seen south park i i'd expect mm -hmm. something this you know over the top and absurd this felt more deserving of that kind mm -hmm. of time i would love to see this thing live so the story is these these two these two actors aaron jackson and josh sharp have everything they're they're playing like straight uh, disgusting, gross businessmen, uh, salesmen, um, and they're they're doing their uh, depiction of what straight salesmen who have everything handed to the white sales who have everything handed to them would have. Uh, and the, but the only thing they're they're missing is family. Like they bang girls and they they do everything. And they're they're doing this all to songs, catchy songs, two great songs. And the only thing they're missing is 
uh, family or any, you know, anyone that they actually care about because it's almost like, you know, uh, imagine Patrick Bateman, uh, but there's two of them, right? And, they're, mm. and then they come to work at the same place where they sell the pieces for um, uh, I, I robot vacuums. They, they don't sell oh, the actual Roombas, vacuums. Yeah. Roombas. They just, it's called Roomba, I think, in, in the movie, in the play, in the, in the musical. Uh, they just sell the parts and they're constantly competing. Like they're the two top salesmen and they hate each other and they're adversaries. And then they learn that they are long lost identical twins. And uh, then they go on this journey to find one was raised by the mom, one was raised, raised by the dad. And they go on this journey to try and get them back together so they can have a family. And that is the entire premise of the movie. They team up these two despicable uh, white straight uh, salesmen um, team up to try and create a family, and that's 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 the the, the kicking off point. All right, uh, I, we that's got inciting incident. Inciting incident. Uh, Megan Mullaney, um, I mean Malali plays the mom. Mal Malali. Uh, Malali, and Nathan Lane plays the dad, and they do this ridiculous uh, thing where the two, because these these two. Josh Sharp and Aaron Jackson, part of the joke is they don't look anything alike, but they are identical twins. So all they do is one, ha Aaron Jackson and Trevor has long hair and Craig, Josh Sharp has short hair. So they just wear wigs and fool their parents into thinking that they are one and the other. It's good. And uh, we also, so Nathan Lane plays the dad and then Bowen uh, Yang plays God. Um, there's a great song at the end, just to give you a flavor. I don't even know if I should say it, but I guess I will because it is a very good song. And this is this is this is a very very funny gay musical ultimately uh, at its heart there's a great song um at the end entitled god is a faggot and it's catchy and it's <laughs> it's great and they're all singing it with such glee and enjoyment this movie is almost geared. i can already tell anderson's going to be playing this in his car the whole summer and get in trouble for playing it this movie is like, just, let's sit down and write it. Jillian, do you plan for Abacus again? That would just <laughs> infuriate Daddy, why is God? What happened? <laughs> you went away. say the word. <laughs> it's almost like they set out to write a musical that would upset any American who doesn't like the word woke. Like, Larry, like, all right, let's just go at, like, Tom Kinney is in this. Um, and... I, I had not seen the trailer. I had heard in passing that this movie was, you know, whatever, but it was a little bit too over the top. The trailer looked like too much. I think it might have been attached to Bottoms when I saw it. It seemed like it could it could go either way. It either just be awful or really good, but it wasn't clear based on the trailer. I got to see this movie in a way where rarely you get to see movies. We talk about this all the time without being inundated with trailers. I had not seen the trailer. So when the sewer boys show up, for the first time i did not know what the fuck i was looking at i did not see them coming and the sewer boys really set the tone and i i i i, I realized oh okay this this movie fucking rules uh megan the stallion i'm not familiar with her but she plays their boss she crushes it at every turn there's a flying vagina that fell off their mom <laughs> just to let you know it, it it fell off their mom at one point and she captured it and that disgusting thing is animated and you see it flying it's disgusting it's horrible they just poke fun and stick and this movie is not well received it's 5.4 on imdb which is absurd i mean obviously people hated the right people hated this movie and downloaded sure. it the groupers did they did this movie definitely got groups groupers uh but and there's uh, there's just the the end credit scene has the uh the spoofs and stuff and nathan lane saying like as he's working with the sewer boys just talking about how the slowest point of his entire career, the most ashamed he'd ever been, I think, <laughs> humiliated he'd ever been. <laughs> this movie had me laughing out loud numerous fucking times. Uh, now, granted, I saw this on the plane. I didn't. Mm. I didn't expect much. I was curious, and I thought I'd watch 15, 20 minutes, and I could not stop. It was. A, it was a delight. I loved. Did you it. watch it on your device or on the plane? Like the this was on the flight from. Uh, I think. Um, from LAX to Hawaii. So I, and then wasn't edited anyway. No, 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 no. It, it's shocking. Like I had to turn, turn it off a couple of times. Cause Attica started to watch and he's <laughs> about the sewer boys. And I'm like, I don't, I can't tell you about the sewer boys. I don't know what to tell you about. The sewer he's going to switch that to the carrot at the end of the, uh, at the end of the stick for the, uh, the spelling test. He's going to want to watch Dick's the musical and start right. Kong. I got him off the track. There's only actually one like montage, uh, really, really like, um, 
I, I shouldn't say that, but I mean, it was obvious a gay sex scene that went on for about 60 seconds in numerous places and numerous positions done for laughs. And that was where I was like, ah, Atticus might have too many questions because, you know, he's seven. He doesn't know what sex is, let alone, you know, uh, actually, he knows about gay relationships and whatnot. But uh, fucking kids are already calling each other gay at school. It's fucking lame. I thought well, we were past that. I thought we had taught these kids better. This is gay. I know. Ironically. I thought we were the last generation to be so fucking dumb with the uh, with the. Uh, yeah, the I, I thought it was all like Dave Franco now from Twenty Two Jump Street. We're like, we don't, we don't, we don't. Uh... It was still big with millennials. That was very big when I was in uh, junior high and high school. Still, it was yeah, oh yeah. It was big with Brian and I until like twenty fourteen, I think. But I don't, that's what I'm saying. I think that's when it became no longer acceptable to say it in like publicly. I fought for us to be able to say it at camp. I mean, that's how fucking clueless I was. I'm like, I don't care. And I use South Park as an example. I'm like, South Park still uses it. Why can't we? And then like my very good friend who's a lesbian, she's like, okay, well, what does gay mean? Like, what do you use it for? I'm like, things that are lame. She's like, do you think that's cool? I'm like, oh, yeah, I guess, I guess not. Listen, put it that way. It's a different word though. It doesn't mean, all right, I'm not going to get into this. I'm like, I even came up with a different spelling. It was just so fun to say gay, but you can't. Shouldn't. Makes you look dumb. All right, let's stop here. All right. Dicks, the musical. Uh, not for everybody, <laughs> but I really, really enjoyed it. A pair of business rivals discover that they're identical twins and decide to swap places in an attempt to tr trick their divorced parents to get back together. Some great musical numbers in this as well. It's kind of what you'd expect from Matt and Trey, but you got but it. It is not from them. From Aaron and Josh. And All Nathan right. Payne really gives it some, um, I guess, some validity. That's Megan Mullally. I feel like she's always very good. She was very good. I thought she was Marissa Tomei a few times. She was very good. I'm not, I'm not really familiar with her. They're different people. I know, but she definitely, she plays a uh, woman in a wheelchair, which I'm sure oh. upset people. Mullally, where would we know Mullally from? I guess Will and Grace? Uh, Will and Grace, Will yeah, and but Grace, she, she yeah. also played uh, Ron Swanson's ex-wife on Parks and Rec, and they're married in real life, so that's funny. Uh, she she plays like a definitely. bunch of like bit uh bit character parts yeah you know, a, a bunch of comedy actress you recognize yeah. but bill and grace right like she's pretty famous for that and she party down she, she was on party down she's great in that yeah. the disaster artist why him and the kings of summer so some things i've seen two james franco movies hmm. all, all right, right. hey all, all right. right real quick let me talk about this documentary that i saw because anderson you might uh, find it interesting have you heard of the documentary that just came out about Phil Hendry called Henry? I have, I have, excuse me. I have heard of it. Yes. I have not seen okay. it. Okay. Hendry is a 2024 documentary directed by Patrick Reynolds, uh, featuring interviews with, uh, Bill Hader, John Apatow, uh, Kevin Pollack, Henry Rollins, Derek Waters, Wayne Fetterman, and Dana Gould question mark. I say that because as far as I could tell, Dana's only in it for one line of the film, which is odd, but may maybe I missed some stuff. Uh, this is uh, just come out. It's very small. Uh, 8.7 8 Anders in a run or on IMDb. No Rotten Tomato score as of now, but uh, this is 69 minutes long, which is not much of a commitment, but also must have been intentional. I cannot imagine that was an accident because. This is a uh, profile of the uh, famous radio host Phil Hendry and his very unique approach to. So yeah, Phil Hendry would do like talk radio, but he would dupe callers into calling the show into responding to characters that he was doing in real time and would then get them on to argue with him as the character and he as the co-host doing the character. So it's a very wild premise where like, he'll, he'll be like, Hey, it's Phil Hendry. I'm talking to so-and-so and, -so. and he'll, he'll literally reach over, lean into a phone and be like, yes, Phil, I'm so-and-so and we're talking about this and that. And then someone will call in outraged at the uh, crazy, stupid yeah, thing. Here's like a premise. He like, he one of my favorites was he it sounded as though he was talking over himself at times. He was so good at doing this. Yes, was, and, and that, I, that's the real art. I think the majority of the audience listening at any given time thought that they were listening to a real caller. 
Sure. And, and realize and many of the talking host. heads, uh, Bill Hader, et cetera, et cetera, uh, confess that like, oh, I didn't catch on to the to the premise, the joke until a, a couple of weeks of listening. Yeah, it took me probably a couple of weeks. Of late. I mean, I was I don't know if we ever talked to Phil Hendry, but I was no, never. obsessed with Phil Hendry to the point I probably shouldn't admit this. But when I was running Pharrell back in 96, at one point, I uh, the the two shows lined up and were on at the same time. And I oh, was listening no. to Phil Hendry in one ear and producing uh, Pharrell in the other ear on the board and playing the drops and listening mm -hmm. to Phil Hendry and laughing at Phil Hendry. And Pharrell thought I was laughing at what he was doing. And yeah, I probably should not have been doing that or admitting that here. But that's the level of. And then I started recording it so I could listen to it later because mm -hmm. it's before podcasts and on-demand listening. So that was the right. only way I could listen to Phil Henry for a while because he, he was always all over there. They're always changing his time slots. And But one of the, all right, two of my favorite uh, examples, just in case people aren't familiar with Phil Henry, is the outrageous um, uh, uh, scenarios he would come up with. One was like a, he was a billionaire and he wanted to make a difference and put a stamp on the world. So he was going to make the oceans dolphins safe uh, 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 once and for all. Uh, and he was uh, going out there with these large fleets, large, large fleets of ships. No, no, uh, tuna safe, right? Mm. And and he was he, large fleets of ships, and he was just slaughtering all the dolphins to keep the tuna safe because he misunderstood. Like this, this billionaire was so dumb he misunderstood that tuna safe meant safe from killing dolphins and bycatch. So he was slaughtering dolphins and keeping the tuna safe, yeah. and people were calling just out fucking. And so. Phil, the host, interviewed this moron billionaire, Phil, the character, of which no one knew, uh, and and called her to call in and be outraged. Yeah, and they would go on and on and on. He had a best of that he would put a CD that he would put out every year that was just the best. I still quote one of them all the time, which was uh, <laughs> somebody said, oh, yeah, one of my friends, and he just cuts them off. He goes, guy like you doesn't have friends. They just have people that laugh behind their back. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> I think I've used that on you a couple times. You might, yeah. It sounds familiar. I didn't realize that it was uh, so insulting. Uh, so the only, the only issue I have with this document is well done. Uh, the only issue is it's just a fundamental issue, which is it's so hard to do a documentary about radio, especially of a certain era, before there was just lots of footage. Like there's a lot of audio that is set to very rudimentary animation or b-roll you know just like an extreme close-up of a microphone and you hear like an extended bit it's good but i don't know how cinematic it is i mean i'm quibbling because this is good and it is entertaining and is fascinating to watch phil hendry do his thing when they do a footage of it that is great but uh it's an inherent issue man it's hard to get around when you're making a documentary about radio well, I, I mean, I think it's great that they're trying to get the word out about Phil Hendry because I, I think that he's tragically overlooked. And there's a lot of people who are probably listening to this right now who have never heard of Phil Hendry. And uh, same with Joe Frank. And I brought up that Joe Frank documentary a, a while ago that came out. And I guess it's finally released now. We got to see it. My buddy Tracy invited me to like a screening of it before it was even released because mm. they're having a hard time getting the, uh, the rights to all the music that Joe Frank had playing underneath his shows. But they're very, very different shows, Joe Frank and, and Phil Hendry. But they were incredibly influential uh, especially out here in the la market in in hollywood and uh it's said in the joe frank documentary that everyone who was like writing producing or doing anything in hollywood pretty much to a man and a woman were all listening to joe frank and phil hendry religiously and mm. they're they're both such overlooked well done radio programs in, in wildly different ways but uh, yeah, I'm glad that there's something out there. It doesn't sound like it's going to reach a large audience, and it's. Kind I would of be surprised. Important. In fact, I I really could have done with more. Like this movie, I I we rarely see it on this on this show because movies are too long these days. This one could have had more. Like there was allusions to his ex-wife and his failed marriage, and radio being a sort of nomadic. Uh, industry or you know you pick up and move here and you pick up and move there and that's just it's kind of like being a football coach i guess but i could have used a little more of that like uh, a little more backstory but as it is this is a solid doc uh, you can rent it and i do recommend it last uh i lost track of, of phil do did they talk about where he is now doing a podcast uh, he was last on KFI, I believe, yeah. um, which is a station out here in Los Angeles. I kind of soured and, on him a little bit when he was on KFI because he wasn't doing a shtick. Oh, really? Which was what made him, and he was doing politics and he was kind of yeah. 
pretty pretty far right and i i didn't even buy what he was selling i think he was just doing it to, to survive is kind of what it felt yeah, like it seems like he's back to the old the old phil okay is the sense that i got uh and uh he was syndicated across the country at his peak so yeah i think this is certainly something that most not most people a, a, a wide um a wide swath of the population would at least uh, uh be familiar with I uh, I missed him, just missed him a, a number of times. He used to drink at this place out in Thousand Oaks regularly that I would hang out at as well, Cisco's mm. uh, Mexican Cantina. And my friends would hang out with Phil Henry many, many times. And they'd call me up and make Phil's over here and I'd get out there and he would have just left. But like he was really open to talking about the show and the characters and all that stuff. Yeah, he, uh, him according to this documentary, he really developed that, that uh, or perfected, I should say, the... Uh, the style we just described they're all familiar with um when he was uh, broadcasting out of ventura which is not very far from thousand oaks so it makes sense that he was in that area a lot I, it's some of the hardest i've ever laughed at listening to radio and he was just so good at it and so quick and uh he, he had this bit where he'd break like <laughs> phil would put his guest who was him on hold because you know he's getting too outrageous and the guy would break through a hold. You'd hear him going, ah, I broke through holes. I'm back on. <laughs> I didn't have that. That's funny. It know. did. It, he really did sound like he was talking over himself at times. It was unbelievable how 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 skilled that guy was. Phil Henry. All Henry, right. the documentary. I recommend it. All right. Very good, Brad. You rented yeah. it. Where'd you, where'd you rent it? Prime? Uh, Amazon. Yeah. Prime. It's on uh, I, uh, Apple TV and a number of other. Yeah, he was on ninety seven one, I think, right back in the day. When... Yeah, the fact I think that's how it opens. He's uh, broadcasting on ninety seven one, but more of a straight DJ at that point. You know what I mean? Like almost like how uh, uh, Carlin went from like you know straight stand up to what he became. Uh, you got the same sense with Phil. Yeah, I think that he was on ninety seven one. It was Stern in the morning, and then Lycus was on there for a bit, and then. Pharrell and Phil Hendry. It was it was quite the lineup that yeah. 90s. And now 97.1 is KNX. 24 hour boring. Okay. Very local. Yeah, very local radio. So but LA is a big market, right? Big uh, radio. Number two radio market in the in the country, Brad. Maybe sure. the world. What's okay. number one? New York? Yeah, New York. New York crushes with the radio. Bunch of New Are you guys uh out. coming up next? Into their wind up radios. Coming up next is Top 5 Movies in Japan. We'll be right back. All right, we're back. Time for Top 5 Time. Uh, Anderson and I actually talked before the episode uh, yesterday. And uh, yes, four of my films are, in fact, Japanese films. One, an American film. Uh, and uh, we'll count those. Do you have any documentaries on your list? I do. And the way I approach this, and I you know, talked to Brian a little bit too late ab uh, about it, but I'm not going with Japanese films. I'm going with movies that take place, happen to take place in Japan, but they're from outside perspectives. Oh. Uh, that's that's how I, I cultivated my list. And it's because I wanted I wanted to include, you know, five movies that made up my idea of what Japan was, you know, over the last years of my life. And uh, it's just, it's too vast when you just go with, you know, Japanese, I mean, it would just be a top five Kurosawa movies or sure. you know, anime Ghibli, Studio Ghibli stuff. So I, I I wanted it to be more focused on, I'm you know a lot of Western ideas of what Japan is. Fair enough. Do you want to? Well, let me kick it off because uh, you alluded to Kurosawa. Number five is Ikaru, 1952, directed by Akira Kurosawa. This is of course set in Japan, and uh, I think uh, fuck do I never been there. But to me, depicts that sort of, granted, 1952, but that everyday life, you know what I mean? That sort of mindless bureaucracy, that big behemoth uh, of what it's like to actually live and toil in Japan in that era. And, uh, this is what uh, it feels like to me. Hog in the wheel. Indeed, yeah, the sort of uh, faceless, heartless bureaucracy that one character is trying to sort of break through. We both uh, caught up with that one just in the last like eighteen months, I'd say. That was Andrew Martin that assigned us uh, Ikaru, and uh, we've been we've been catching up on a lot of Kurosawa stuff uh, thanks to Andrew. Who continues to assign us uh, Kurosawa because yes. he's a real blind spot like for me. So thank 24 you. Twenty-four movies, and I had seen probably seven of them before Andrew started assigning them. And you know, 
each one, even I saw his very first one, which was a tough transfer, but every movie you can see, it's a masterful filmmaker. There's no denying it. And I think Ikaru might be one of my favorites uh, that, that he's done. And they remade it. Yeah. Called, it was called Living, right? It came out last year. Yeah, with uh, Bill Nye. Bill and Nye. it was fine, but, uh, you know, uh, Ikaru, pales in comparison. Ikaru is poignant and makes you not only think about life, uh, but makes you cry. And, uh, yeah, it's it, it sticks with you. So, good. Good one there, Bri Bri. Number five for me is the, uh, we already talked about, uh, Jiro, Jiro, uh, Dreaming of Sushi. And uh, we t- spoke about that earlier on this episode. And that is my number five. Oh. And it's the outsider's look at this uh, world-renowned uh, sushi. Wait, it's an restaurant. outsider's look? You mean yeah, like it's, it's not a Japanese production. Oh, I didn't know that. And I mean, it's mainly in, in, in English. And it was a Netflix. I mean, I there's a lot that. of translation going on, but like, because he doesn't speak English, but there's, it, it, it was made for Western audiences. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And it tells the story of Jiro, who uh, uh, runs what's considered the most world-renowned sushi restaurant, if not restaurant, in the entire world. He's the only chef to ever have received three Michelin stars. Uh, and he's been stripped of those stars, I guess, since this movie came out. Because oh, really? It, 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 um, it, it kind of became a, a problem. Uh, it was like a catch-22 almost because it became such a popular restaurant after the documentary came out. It's a tiny little like 12-seater or something in a subway uh, in the, the Geisa um, uh, area of Tokyo and no one can get reservations there. And the whole point of Michelin stars is like a road uh, traveler's guide to good restaurants, right? It comes from the Just tire. It's green book for restaurants. Yeah, and if you can't get a reservation there, you can't be um, up for being on their list because you are not accessible. So no, I but, do not I do not believe you can be stripped of the stars. You just don't get them longer right eligible. Here. Yeah, they like they don't they don't is that Taylor Swift cup? It is. I have the same cup. I'm looking at it right now. It's because we go to where, where did you acquire this cup? That's an AMC AM, exclusive. They they got too many of those Taylor Swift cups and uh there was a deal to be had if you go to the movie theaters and they you could buy a, a large Coke for a dollar if it was a Taylor Swift. Because they had too many of them, they were trying to get rid of them. So I have like four or five of those things. That sounds they're, like a they're good cups. Excuse. They're, they're good for large smoothies and uh, forty ounce drinks. I'm probably gonna retire this one though because we just got a new one. Ooh, when we went and saw Ghostbusters yesterday, and it has a red monkey on it. That has oh, a- oh yes. So that that is my new cup. Yes. All right. But yeah, uh, Jiro dreams of sushi. It really does show the uh, the pursuit of perfection and. Uh, lineage and um i i'm i'm in in doing the research i'm really i i really feel like i got to. i know i'm probably never gonna have an opportunity to go back to japan and that that hurts because i feel like there's so much that i i would have liked to have seen and more it's you can't there's just so much i was overwhelmed you go back i don't know because there's a lot to see out there in the world i don't know if i have you know but uh, I didn't even, you know, take time, have the time to go try and track down, at least walk down there and see the actual little restaurant. I didn't, I didn't get a chance to do that, and I was staying right there. I probably got to walked. I'm you afraid you chose to, the Kill Bill restaurant. See how close it is to the hotel that we're staying at. I'm, I'm afraid to look. It might have been across the street. Oh, there's so many, like you, you. I don't think anyone eats at home in Japan. Like it's just nothing but restaurants. That's all really? they have. It's all they have. It's just oh. restaurant after restaurant. Like you're just walking, you're like, what? The stairs go down to a sushi place down in the basement. And it's, it's just all like restaurants a... and vending machines, I've heard. And that's all it is. And no one can walk and eat. All right. Did you get anything out of a vending machine? Oh, yeah. Lots of coffees. Nice. Hot coffee. Or the quality of the coffee. Very good. Very really? good. Yeah, and they're hot and they're cheap as fuck. It's like, hey. But to about 70 cents for a hot, Hand coffee, cream and sugar. Oh, so good. I drink my coffee black, but over there, I was cream and sugar in it. Good stuff. Sounds good. Yeah, and it's cold day, so you buy a hot one. They have the vending machines have cold and hot drinks in the same vending machines, and not a single vending machine ever stole money or fucked me over. And I probably did, I don't know, 30 transactions. Damn. All right. All right. Your- Number four for me, uh, Japanese, or sorry, movie set in Japan. Happens to be a Japanese film uh, from 2000, uh, Battle Royale. That, that really rarely gets brought up on the show, despite being a good movie. Um, although the one flaw, Anderson, you remember Battle Royale, of course. Yeah, yeah, I love it. The, 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 I, I enjoyed it very much. The one flaw 
I can't get over with the the premise. Is the original so Hunger they, Game is yeah, no Stanley so that, Tucci. That's a whole nother. The the author of Hunger Games claims to have never heard of Battle Royale, uh, which is I'm not going to get into it. But that's that's. I mean, it's kind of an obscure movie. I want to be shocked. The point that I made when I figured I flick fest this, and I'll make it again because it's been a number of years. Anderson, mm. I can tell you as an author, oh, when you turn in a manuscript and you, you're dealing with a publisher, the lawyers will haul out every possible, like, oh, the, the, every possible comp, every possible um, um uh, book that could be related, it could be ripped off from, or whatever. Trust me, there is no, there is, it is inconceivable that uh, this person wasn't at least alerted. Like, hey, this is a lot like that Japanese movie, uh, the uh, Battle Royale. That mm. said, that's the story, and they're sticking to it. I can't argue with it. What I can argue with is the premise of Battle Royale is they take these misbehaving high school kids, put them on an island, and they must duel to the death. Uh, till there is, I guess, one or whatever survivors. Um, if the idea is to keep kids in line, which it, it, in the film, that's the idea. Don't train them to be killers. What good is it to, to kill all the kids? You want them to go back and tell the story of like, oh shit, I was misbehaving and I got taken to this island. As opposed to, I'm dead. There's one survivor. There is, there is one survivor. I can tell the, the woes of their ways. Regardless, that's a minor quibble. This is a very good movie and um, hard to watch. No, no, hard to watch. It's it's, it's just dark. It's literally dark. It's dark. It's a little bit uh, rough around the edges. Yeah, it's independent. Brian, author Brian really came out there on that. That's right. Yeah. Well, as an author, I do think writing. I do think Battle Royale got its due though because it is so uh, synonymous with a. Uh, that concept that there's an entire genre or type of game that is called battle royale that's mm -hmm. what fortnite is and it's all just a bunch of players are dropped into one area and only one survives so i think it's gotten its due that's you its own genre right like the movie predator or even predators uh, uh the the sequel predators like yeah you're all dropped in and one or none will survive but yeah it's never that entire yeah, genre of video game is named after the uh, the movie so mm -hmm. what kind of a sadistic um security uh tester is 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 testing these like oh, how how much testing do you need to do? is it going on for a, a lot time. apparently apparently it it's because normally they'll give you a window they're like oh it'll be from nine until 11 i didn't realize they meant it'll literally go from until nine 9 a.m 11, 11 p.m oh, it's 11 02 now so still go all right uh number is it number four for me and number number four for me oh i'm going highbrow on you here brian i'm going uh highfalutin and uh, I'm bringing you Hiroshima. Oh. Hiroshima. Am I saying that right? Well, no, we say Hiroshima, but it's Hiroshima. You know, Tokyo is not even called Tokyo over there. I forget what it's called, but like we rename every. Why do we got to rename everything? Tokyo. I, is and not that's one of your best observations. I quote you all the time uh, in relation to uh, Florence and Venice and all those dying cities. Like, can we not say Venezia? Can we not say Firenze? How, how is that? It's like Tokyo. I, I don't have the actual. Maybe Avery can look it up in between beeps, but like they they don't it's it's spelled differently. It's I think it's pronounced a little differently. Anyway, uh, we say Hiroshima. It's Hiroshima. Uh, Mon Amour is the name of the movie. It's uh, from French filmmaker Alain Ren or Rene Rene Alain Rene. This Rene. isn't real. This is uh this is like Florence trolling us. It's a uh, he's a French uh, filmmaker, a French New Wave filmmaker. Uh, this was his uh, feature debut, and he set out. He and uh, Marguerite Duras. Uh, set out in 1958. They were commissioned. He was a world-renowned um, documentarian at the time. He had made one on the uh, you know, World War II uh, Nazi, Nazi death camps. And then they commissioned him to make one about uh, the after effects of Hiroshima. And uh, in doing so, he realized that he could not do it justice. And there's no way you can wrap up what happened there in a documentary. So he went against the grain and somehow sold them on a fiction fictionalized film which involved a french actress the storyline is a french actress has a 36 hour uh, uh, affair with a japanese man uh, they both come from trauma uh, they both have large uh tears in the fiber fabrics of their their own storylines uh one involving uh, nazis 
and one involving uh, Hiroshima. And it's really about memory and how you can't do memory just ju memory doesn't do justice to what actually happened. You what can't is it called again? Mon Amour or what? It's called Hiroshima Mon Amour. And mm -hmm. this is one of my film school uh, movies that I was um, force fed in film school, but it actually had a, a, a pretty resounding effect on me while watching it. He used a, a lot of actual footage, uh, which mm -hmm. is hard to see from Hiroshima uh, that he intertwined with. Uh, this this movie and you know it's it's he's trying it's the kind of movie you got to see a few times um i've only suffered through it once and i say suffered through it you know respectfully uh, it is not an easy watch respectfully <laughs> but you know it's it's one of those movies i mean it really and, and at times it's gorgeous it's black and white and it's with all the neon lights going on in in that part of the world and uh Japan in uh, you know the late 1950s is a delight unto itself, and then these two characters trying to piece their lives back together and and grapple with you know the just the unspeakable atrocities that they have uh, had to had to deal with. So yes, Hiroshima Monomore is a movie that I would not uh, recommend to everyone uh, by any far stretch. But if you're a cinephile, you really like challenges. Uh, chances are you've already seen this. Uh, or you're familiar with it, but it, it is it is um, mm. something to labor through. Wow. I have the an update on. Uh, so oh. here we in English we call it Tokyo, but there it's it's spelled the same, but it's pronounced Tokyo. So it's two syllables. In no, 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 it's Japanese. definitely not spelled the same over there. It's 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 like T with an O with a line over it, K Y and O with a line over it. That's what that's what Google is telling me. Because mm. I saw it like on buses and on on walls and it was a different spelling it was almost like t-o-k-h-o or something yeah I think, avery i think you got the phonetic spelling there maybe uh but it's tokyo is Japanese how it's characters like, anyways yeah. so i mean I, you know, a, a lot of shockingly amount uh, a large amount of english over there like all the subways uh they they say everything in japanese obviously and then they give you the uh, the english version as well i guess that's because english is kind of a universal language for a lot of uh travelers so but uh, yeah, that that was that was easy to navigate when they were telling you what was not all the trains. Actually, there was a couple of subways that I was on where I'm like, oh, you're not going to give me the English on this one. I, I don't know what's going on. Unhelpful. Yeah, I was navigating those uh, subways with Atticus and I went out. We had to get across town to Yokohama to see the Gundam. Um, yeah. And five -story, what, what, five -story, what was that? What was a that? Five story robot. Oh, that Geo was demanding that Atticus and I go see it. I was playing, paying tribute to Geo for helping us get over to Japan. Geo was, Johnny, uh, that was is a uh, Atticus overwhelmed. I'll I'll get to that. I didn't get a chance to get to that on the after disaster, but it is a saga, and it 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 ends in a very very sorrowful way. Oh, lots of disappointment. I'm glad I that look forward to. That said, though, and we we did see this giant five story high robot get up from a kneeling position and move for around 10 minutes. And it is like oh, nothing I've ever seen. We I'm, just saw I'm, I'm a side right. point of view um, uh, that was not the paid point of view that we paid for. We saw it from the outside over the wall and uh, we didn't get the full effect. Because hey, of, uh, I, uh, I, I suggest... rule. they follow rules in Japan. Like no other society I've ever, I've ever been. Around. Did you run into uh, they have a problem with your visible tattoos anywhere? No, but I did hear that I wasn't going to go on, be allowed to go on the 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 public hot tub at the Snow Monkey oh, yeah. Park because of my tattoos. But since we were the only ones staying in the inn, I guess I got away with it. But the other that, way. that is the thing: like tattoos are not supposed to be uh, presented in in public. Avery, I'm sorry to button hook you on this. We're going to take a break early before our number three because I have to pee, and then we'll come back and we'll uh, do my three. Your three, right? Right? Yeah, we usually do after after number three, do it before number three. Makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Love it. Amazon yeah. next list after that. Thank you guys sincerely for uh, continuing to use and uh, patronize the Amazon link over at AndersonBrian.com. We appreciate it while Anderson was gallivanting across the uh, Pacific. But uh, we come to you stuff with to I got stuff to see. Upwards of three weeks worth of purchases on Amazon. So Avery, heads up, uh, I might not hit the post exactly right. Not Here are the things purchased on Amazon in our stead while we are absent, uh, and you guys continue to support the show. 
Thank you. Eight, count them, eight. Brother Genuine Super High Yield Toners and a Brother Drum Cartridge was also, per also purchased. Anchor Solix Portable Power Station was picked up. Someone got themselves a Tomahawk Backpack Mosquito Fogger. A Casio G-Shock Series wristwatch. Shore Wireless Handheld Microphone. Shark sure. Lift Away True Pet Vacuum. Acer Predator Gaming SSD was picked up. Uh, shoes, my God, you guys all picked up shoes. Ultra Lone Peak Running Shoe. New Balance uh, Rove Running Shoe. Olukai Milo Athletic Shoe. And Olukai Nohia Moku Boat Shoes were all purchased. Thank you guys for doing that. Crown Automotive Steering Kit. Uh, someone got themselves Pet Safe Cozy Up Dog Ramp. A Ring Floodlight Cam and a Ring Doorbell Plus were both purchased. Wet and Forget Stain Remover. Blend Tech Wet Wild Side Plus Jar uh, was purchased. Iron CK Bookshelves. 20,000 address labels. Uh, thank you for uh, labeling your pizzas. Uh, unless someone else was inspired to get 20,000 address labels. Very Steam. random to someone who doesn't listen closely, Brian. Seems, Seems very random. Like, what's that? Seems very random, what you just said, if, if someone isn't listening closely. That's a good point. Every episode. Uh, you know what, though? That's, uh, that's, that's for the uh, people who listen closely. Yoto Kids, a Bluetooth speaker. Uh, a, do a dome, a, a, a dome, a dome, Jesus Christ. A dome, let's just say a dome, cat. Six cube store dragonizer. Uh, Boom Joy ceiling fan. Brady, portable label printer kit. Two, mount it. Exclamation point. Mount it. Ultra wide monitor desk mount. Uh, pre packed triple width wall storage cabinet. Sterilite 70 quart storage bins. Uh, DeWalt 20 volt max battery charging kit. A 4K support projector. Isopure protein powder was purchased. Two rolls of 20 bond paper, 20 pound bond paper. Bolger's Classic Roast Ground Coffee, Logitech MX Master Bluetooth Mouse, an Xbox Wireless Controller and Shock Blue, Optimum Nutrition L-Glutamine Muscle Recovery Powder, Elite Gourmet Electric Skillet, delicious. I doubt the skillet is delicious, but you're going to cook it. It's probably delicious. Yeah. Kickler uh, Fix, two wall, two, Kickler Fix, two light wall sconce, uh, two, QCAA solid brass hinges, Foxy Fane, Foxy Fane, healthy snacks and treats, a holiday gift box, very nice, a Roku, Roku, a Roku streaming stick, a full port ball valve, and a fresky, a fresky turkey tendon dog treats. That sounds yeah, al, fr al fresco. Uh, I'm reading that fresh. My eyes see a fresky. Uh, <laughs> Lego Super Mario. What, 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 I realize, you know what? For those of you listening closely, <laughs> we did not talk at all about the Oscars and what we witnessed on the live broadcast uh, when we came back and did the uh, regular broadcast, which I, I think we were remiss. And we, we yeah, we're foolish. We didn't talk anything about the Oscars as, as though everyone heard it. And that was for a very select few people who watched along with us. And we didn't get into all the insanity and stupidity that happened on those uh, Academy Awards. All right. Okay, fair enough. Three things left, Avery. I Lego Super Mario. My <laughs> eyes see a fresky. Lego Super Mario Adventures with Peach Starter Course, Nespresso Capsules, and Tony Pecos Pickle and Pepper. Oh, is that Carano? Is that Carano ordering some more I, Tony I, Pecos? I, I don't have any identifying Pickle. information. Pickles. Unfortunately. Pickles. It was okay. sent to Tucson. Well, uh, Michael. Well, wanted yeah eat the squid jerky that i brought him from japan uh, last night so that's that's disappointing i feel like you could have guessed that do you guys see that uh viral video of the guy that crashed into the uh, car and was looking maniacal and yes i did not know and he had this wild smile on his face and he just rear-ended a car and he didn't give a fuck and he was like yeah yeah and he was listening to my Corona <laughs> yes. uh, podcast about delivery and Bert. I did hear Corona yeah. describe this. It was, it was loud as could be in his car. And this viral video, just to totally coincidental. Loud as could be in his car. He was blaring that, the show. 
And all you can hear is Mike Carano in the background as this insanity is happening. You hear Mike Carano coming from within his car saying, and uh, we had Burt Reynolds' head in the box. And they're making the, the clickety clack, clickety clack. <laughs> so Mike Carano, fun. big, big with the meth heads. Big with the speed, big, big with the meth, the, the speed users. Here, click this is the last time I talked at you. Uh, two people, not one, but two people got the zone of interest. Juan the Grudge was uh, clicked through as well as Legend of Blood Castle, Caddyshack, Blue Jasmine. Fuck the ass with the Blue Jasmine. I like that Blue Jasmine quite a bit. Uh, the Dark Tower clicked through as well as Ghostbusters Afterlife. The Innocence fucked the ass with the Innocence. One of the greatest pound fisting moments I ever had was fucked the ass with that. The Innocence, where a certain thing happened. Unfortunately, it wasn't at the pound climate. fisting moments. You know, like where I, I clench my fist and I go, fuck yeah. Like that happens in movies. Fist pounding. Fist pounding. Like, yeah. Like you pump the air. Like, yeah, let's do this. Like the, well, I, think the, I know what you meant. Pound, what you, pound, what you, what you pound fisting is, pound fisting is pound an only fans category. Yeah. Guys, I'm sick. sick. What do you think? It I mean? What do you think it means? What do I think pound fisting means? Fist pounding? That's me yeah, doing your dad. One, they're interchangeable. Pound fisting, fist pounding. That's, That's me doing your dad. What, what do you think it means? I don't like you doing my dad. My dad's gone. The innocence. Was a fuck yeah, fist pounding, pounding the end of three billboards outside of Ebbing, Missouri. That was like when I saw what was happening there and the team up that was about to occur. We never got to see it because the movie just ends, but I hit the hit the air with my fist. I'm like, fuck yeah, let's do this. All right. Sorry. Showing up was click through. Still need to see that showing up. The Starling Girl, your lucky day, the holdovers, fuck this. Poor things, fuck this. The zone of interest purchase. Someone wanted to buy that and own it. That's a that's a gutsy move. Argyle was clicked through, which I heard that there was a bunch of uh, conspiracy theorists out there suggesting that Taylor Swift wrote Argyle. Hmm. They're trying to make that a trilogy, apparently. Argyle and trilogy. Yeah, yeah. Wait, what did Taylor Swift do? There's, people are suggesting that she wrote Argyle. Um, the worst ones was clicked through. Makes a lot of sense. Pretty good. We like that one. Of the worst. Three people got the promised land. Tight. Two people got the iron claw. Two people. Click through and got American fiction. Thank you for that. Little children fucked to the S. Hey, guys, some real winners this week. Cruising was clicked through as well as War Horse. Thank you for your purchase. War, War, War Horse. My chill was clicked through as well as the Deer Hunter fucked to the S. Bean Pool. I don't know. Some bean pool got hit by the bus. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Portrait of a Lady on Fire. Baby Teeth fucked to the S. It's a couple Nick Eats Cakes movies that have been clicked through on here. Uh, Everest was clicked through as well as The World to Come. First Cow. <laughs> Brian. First Cow is clicked through. Cakes. That's right. Every place. Oily Cakes. <laughs> Oily Cakes. <laughs> Rampage was clicked through as well as Show Me Love. The Gentleman. Elvira Madagon. Mustang was clicked through. Hey, I like that Mustang quite a bit. The holdovers clicked through again. Uh, instead of putting two, Brian just put it two separate times on the list. Makes my list longer. Hey, same thing uh, over here with poor things. That was already uh, labeled. So and, uh, I guess uh, two people got poor things. Thank you for that. Fallen leaves was clicked through. Someone didn't heed my warning, but people seem to like that fallen leaves. I think I might be kind of uh, uh, on my own on that one. The taste of things was clicked through. I still need to see. Oh, you can click through all the taste of things now. I will have a smorgasbord. Taste. Watching. Taste. I am going to be watching. <laughs> Tell me, champion. Very excited about that taste. taste. Eating, eating good foods while watching. Uh, Colossus, the Forbidden Project, was clicked through as well as Brazil, the Criterion Collection. I need to revisit that Brazil. I think I get a lot more out of it now that I'm not 15 years old. You know what I mean? The Five was clicked through as well as Born in Flames, Unflick, aka Dirty Money. Unflick? Dirty, okay. To Die For was clicked. Hey, you know what? To Die For is a movie that never gets brought up on this program, and it's fucking great. It's one of Gus Van Sant's best. To die for. Lynch Oz was clicked through, which we uh, we we discussed uh, a number of months ago, as well as Battle at Lake Shongjin. Uh, that is available on YouTube for free because uh, Uncle Sam's not uh, real real excited about uh, us watching Chinese propaganda for profit. Uh, however, I recommend it, it. It is only a two dollar rental, so way to way to click through and thank you for that i appreciate that and uh ballsy move too after hearing us talk about it unless you click through to watch along with us and then hear us talk about it after battle mm -hmm. of like chung jing i'm glad that i got that down the gullet and it's in my brain but i would never want to watch that again if i'm but, telling you if that was a shorter movie that's a perfect watch along perhaps yeah maybe ah, so great i was so bored there was so much shit going on and like, my brain cannot compute i'm like my, my brain's like, why are you falling asleep right now when there's so much shit happening? I'm like, I don't know. I was so bored. 
It dulls the senses. It really does. It really does. But then, right, then we cut away to the American troops and it sings. <laughs> Just they're gonna cook our turkeys. They're gonna cook our turkeys. I'd like to live in that Thanksgiving. Just pile high with Thanksgiving food. Just slop everywhere. Just just waste. Gluttonous waste. All right. Oh, Thank so you very nice. much for, for clicking through. And uh, now back to the program. All right. Welcome back. Time to finish up our list of top five films set in Japan. I, I got good news for you, Anderson. My three and two films, which we'll discuss sh- shortly, high in the fun scale. Yeah, I, I went with that highfalutin highbrow, uh, Hiro- Hiroshima, uh, more and more. But uh, don't worry, I dumb it down as I go. In fact, I'm going to need you to uh, help me out here with these. Uh, I'm not sure if they were assigned by you or listeners or how we got to these. But number three for me, Beyond the Infinite Two Minutes, 2022 film directed by Junta Yamaguchi. And uh, it's just 71 minutes, a scant 71. Uh, my brain did start to melt trying to follow all of the uh, so good. all the permutations of the story. But uh, yes, it is a, a very fun movie, very inventive, and uh, doesn't slow down to explain a lot of things. It's a limited storytelling, as Anderson and I like to uh, like to describe films. It takes place in mostly one setting, uh, and very inventive. The oh, less you know, apartment. the better. Yeah, I wish it did slow down to explain why the extension cord wasn't possibly long. Like, why why would they have a computer monitor uh, connected to a 30-foot-long yeah. extension? The story doesn't work without it, but just write something in. I don't know. That was that was the only distracting thing. But, yeah, it's, it's all about having a portal through a computer screen to see two minutes into the future and what comes out of that and what what happens because of that. Wow, well, put- so fun. So plausible too, right? I mean, if so, that, did you or, did you discover this, or was it assigned to us? How we? I think a listener it? might have uh, maybe I like one of those things where a listener or two were like emailing me saying, "You got to see this; it's pretty great." And, you know, we have a lot of listeners who watch a lot of like outlying shit, and uh, if they feel like it's good enough for for us, they'll they'll uh, alert me. Right. You know? Thanks to whoever uh, originated this. I enjoyed There's a chance. The- a chance the I'm wrong, two two sign, but I really don't. I really don't think so. I'm. I'm assuming one cut of the dead is your your next, but we'll we'll get to that. I think either you assigned it to me or I watched it after you had talked it up. Yeah, it was a number That's of years. Recollection. So. All right, number three for me is Gaspar No Wees. I guess you should just say it's just so hard. I've been calling him Gaspar No for a long, long time. To call him Gaspar No, he doesn't feel right. Gaspar No sounds so much better. Uh, either way, Gaspar No We Gaspar No uh, 2009 Enter the Void. It is a Shibuya, a Tokyo, a, a lit up um, acid trip of a movie that makes Tokyo seem even more electric and alive mm. than what I saw in person, uh, for sure. And uh, Enter the Void was this follow up to Irreversible. And I remember going into the New Art Theater to watch Enter the Void and being like, like physically nervous, Brian. Like my stomach was like. Like in knots, I was like, I didn't, I didn't know what I was getting in for. I was, I was nervous, and rightfully so. I mean, it's a very upsetting, disturbing, inspiring, strange, hundred percent POV movie about a man who dies early on in Shibuya, which is a section. It's that crazy, like Times Square of the part of uh, Tokyo, where you see, you know, from the overhead with all the people going in all the different directions in that intersection, and it's just nonstop chaos and mm. light. And uh, the opening, uh, I think this has come up on top five opening title sequences. I, I'm sure it was on my top five for that. It just starts off with such a bang with the, the most impressive title sequence I've ever seen as far as just different effects and noise and loud. I mean, Gasper has a very particular style and there's no mistake in it. And with this one, it's pretty much like just a, a, a theory on afterlife. But it takes place primarily, especially in the beginning, uh, in the streets of, of Tokyo and uh, gives it an electric energy that's, uh, you know, yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's very good. Challenging at times, jarring at other times, uh, but it's it's good. It's uh, what was your experience with the Shibuya? Shibuya? Uh, I ate raw horse by mistake. Oh, that's a real thing that happened. Just like a week ago? Yeah. Wow. 
went to Shibuya. I went to a Dr. Noah restaurant. They were smoking in this restaurant. It was one of the, because they're very anti-smoking in Japan. Like you're not even allowed to smoke on the street. Like there's, there's like, they have Seven Elevens over there and family marts and they have like little smoking rooms in some of them. And you just see all these people packed in there all smoking on top of each other. It's disgusting, but you're not, it's not illegal to smoke on the street. It's illegal to litter, but it's not illegal to smoke on the street, but it's considered very rude. So no one does. Mm. Um, but uh, sometimes you go into a restaurant and they're just fucking smoking up a storm because it's like an older restaurant. And the owner oh, doesn't grandfather it in. Yeah. And uh, I saw something on there's pictures on this menu is the first place that we went to uh, in Shibuya when Atticus Shulin and I went there just to, to see what it was all about. Yo, you, you, saw, you saw sea biscuit on there and you said, yes, please. I saw sashimi and it looks like, you know, just red ahi tuna. And I'm like, all right, I'll get a little taste of that. The price wasn't bad. And then it came to the table and it was obviously not fish. And I just thought it was raw beef. And I had a couple bites uh, and I looked at the menu again. Put on my glasses and then did the Google Translate. I'm like, uh, honey, I'm I'm eating horse right now, raw horse. Yeah, I don't know where to go with that. And I, no, I didn't want to throw it away, but I felt guilty while eating the horse. I wanted to put yeah, it. Yeah, but out. this feels uh, uh, antithetical to everything you believe in. I know, but at the same time, throwing it away doesn't make it any better. So I choked it down, and it was actually kind of kind of tasty. I was gonna say it was pretty good. Yeah. It was, pretty, it was actually pretty good. It tasted like raw beef. It probably was raw beef. I mean, it's called, of course. Sure. Yeah, that's how it works. Oh, uh, yeah. The Japanese are known for confusing things. Yeah, they, <laughs> they play fast and loose with the details. <laughs> they do not. Uh, <laughs> All right. Number uh, two for me. Yes, you guessed it and you ruined it. Uh, it is one cut of the dead. One cut of the dead, number two, uh, 2017 film. You did assign this to me, yeah? Yeah, I believe so. This I mean, I remember going blown in. away by it and loving it and saying, you got to see this, Brian. So probably, I don't know. If I remember not. being angry at you for the first like act, maybe hour. the act and a half. I'm like, I, this the first is, hour. Yeah. The first, like, like, 20, 30 uh, minutes. It's like, what this am I This is in no way remarkable. Yeah. It's unbelievable that anyone saw this entire movie. You know what I mean? Because like uh, most people, I, if I had started watching this movie on a whim, I'd be like, eh, uh, not for me. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's unremarkable. It's not bad. It's just like, okay, right, um, this is uh, kind of rough around the edges. And then the third act comes in. Oh, you are you are rewarded. It's so good. It's so fucking good. And it's it's kind of forgotten. It doesn't get it's new. It doesn't get talked about on a regular basis. That and um, um, the the, the two minutes. What, what was it called? Beyond the infinite. Beyond the infinite. Two minutes. Yeah. Both of them. And I think that, I don't know, I guess the closest we got is everything everywhere all at once, which everyone really enjoyed and, you know, sort of the Academy. But uh, these two movies are kind of similar in what they're doing with just the over the top insanity of looking inward. Yeah. Um, and barreling forward smaller, too. Much smaller scales, but yeah. And I believe they're both sort of um, the other creating the illusion of, uh, of uh, an unbroken cut, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're both going. Uh, that's the, that's the yeah that's that's the the me mechanism that drives them forward is that there are no cuts in either i i still i remember how much fun i think i turned the corner on this movie when the director the director in the movie uh is shoving his actors and, he, and just screaming action yes he's, he's a very like, angry. Hydron! he's a very totalitarian director but he was like, he was manic, but he was also exacting, if that makes sense. Like, yes, this is where you go. Action. Because he wasn't supposed to be the director, right? That way he was like, call it a blast minute or something. Oh, uh, right. right? Well, he was like, yep. someone dropped out and they made him the director like at the last second. I, th I thought that was the, the gimmick. It may have been. There's three movies in that one movie, essentially. and So much fun. Would like to go one back. cut of the that dead, was, you guys. Really fun. That one's short too, right? Uh, pro, I'll look up the details right now. But yes, they remade it too. I think English. They remade oh, it really? in English. For that. I yeah. say that. And then I was told that it's just not. I got the screener for it, and then I was told that it, it's 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 not good. And that, in fact, it kind of takes away from the original. I'm like, fuck that. Not taking away from my memory. Get that shit out of here. The one way. cut. One cut has an epic length of uh, 96 minutes. Uh, compared to the 71 and uh, infinite two minutes. Uh, you can stream it on AMC plus or shutter, or you can rent it across multiple platforms. 
a U.S. Army veteran, Brian, named Nathan Algren. Um, he's hired by the Japanese emperor to train mm -hmm. his army in modern warfare techniques. And Nathan finds himself trapped in a struggle between two eras and two worlds in The Last Samurai. The Last That's Samurai. Ed's Wick, movie. yeah. Yeah, Edward's the Wick. I don't know if this movie has ever come up on this program. And it has I because... I remember I, I, I described to you having seen this on the Santa Monica Varsity Promenade of all places and getting out and immediately wanting sushi. Why would you say of all places when there's three separate movie plexes on Third Street Promenade? Uh, because I don't believe the, the words Third Street Promenade have ever been spoken on this show. Probably have been because I talk about Pee Wee's big adventure now. That's where his, his bike uh, got that, you know, that's actually fair. made sense because Third Street Promenade, which is a very touristy, safe, you know, like Paul, like a uh, sanitized spot now. Like when I was oh, yeah. growing up out there, it was dangerous as fuck. And it was funny that Pee Wee's bike got stolen there and it would have gotten stolen there back when they shot there. Cause it was, uh, it was not a safe area. All right. Anyways, but the, the last samurai, um, it is as tropey as can be. It's a very Western take on Japanese ancient culture. It's very whitewashed. Very whitewashed, yet it works, and I really, really like this movie. And I'm, I think I'm a bit ashamed to say how much I like it, but I really, really like. It. I saw it twice in the theaters. You know, it rings in at seven point eight on IMDb, so I'm not alone. Uh, it's Tom Cruise doing his Tom Cruiseliness, and it it reminded me a lot, or uh, uh, the Dark Knight, the first Dark Knight, where Dark Knight Begins, mm -hmm. reminds me a lot of this. It's just uh, all about training, and in, in certain ways, immersing yourself in the culture. Yeah. And uh, I like that last time quite a bit. I think it's a it's it's a good example of the Western's idea uh, or or lens of uh, the ancient Japanese culture. Yes, yeah, it's a good example of white man comes to save the day. Yeah, it is a great example of that. It it uh, almost feels save like, uh, 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 dances with wolves to an extent. Uh, saving what? Are we going to talk about white men saving days later? Oh, I was just going to, uh, when we get to the, uh, the listener list, I was going to say, if you're craving, uh, you got the taste of the Japanese flavor, Shogun on FX. Dive in if you have not dove in yet. <laughs> it's it being is good pounded down, down my eyeballs, so I will not. As it should be. It should be crammed in your eyes at all times. Shogun. Looks, looks like Mulan. And I'm it's, out. It, it is not. It is anything but. I think there's three episodes left, so if you're waiting to binge it all at once i think uh end of april early may is when you can dive in and uh, enjoy a little shogun we went to a few of those imperial palaces like they they actually you know maintain and you know keep the imperial palaces from like the 1600s like up to 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 code and they're like very well well nice man maintain nicely maintained and you can buy admittance and walk through these ancient ancient buildings where shoguns were and Oh, it's 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 glorious. He, it really is. Well, I'm telling you, you, you'll you'll enjoy it. Is a it is a white man who who doesn't care. He's quite gruff and quite quite foul mouthed. And, okay, uh, the, he rubs a lot of the, the Japanese people the wrong way, but he's also good at what he does, and uh, it isn't it is enjoyable. Is it is it like the Last Samurai? It, it, I have not <laughs> seen the Last Samurai, but it's the same era, and it seems a lot like what you described. Um, but he's more rough around the edges and likes doing a lot more swearing and and grumbling and. Uh, is a real real british twat it's great the last samurai on paper seems like just the worst idea it's like an american uh, uh modern soldier is hired by the japanese government to train these samurai how to become you know modern soldiers it's and a then, throwback movie and then the american like learns the errors of his american ways and he's like actually the samurai way is better and he immerses himself and becomes a samurai like the opposite it's, it's a it's a lot like what you're describing except for so it's based on the source material and they did sort of the opposite of what killers of the flower moon did where they went okay the source material is mostly from whitey's point of view what if we did the same story but it's from the japanese perspective uh, uh so it's a lot more rich and detailed mm -hmm. and uh we'll get more enjoyable right enjoyable my, and it's in my recollection again having seen this 20 whatever years ago is that I don't want to give too much away, although it's it's a matter of history. Like, yeah, he adopts the samurai ways and uh, uh, joins their forces. Doesn't go well for the samurai as they are fighting against uh, uh, newly developed machine guns. It could be could be uh, true, but I, I believe it does go well for them at at, at times because of their ancient ways. And... Until they meet up with the modern warfare, and it's like, oh shit! And then that, that, these guys have uh, Gatling guns. 
Cruz's face where he's like, what have I done? <laughs> kind of. Yeah. All right. My number That's one? My number two last samurai. I had something else I was going to say about that last samurai, but I'm good, I guess. I what year was that? Oh, two, 2000? Uh, it was 2003, and uh, yeah, it was like he also made uh, his wake. He made uh, Courage Under Fire, which I am a big champion of. I love that Courage Under Fire. All but, right, you know, but he did. Uh, didn't he do Glory? I don't. He may have. I never saw Glory, so. Oh, right. mm. I thought you hit Brian with the "Hey, man, <laughs> come on." He did Shakespeare in Love. Shakespeare no, he did not. Love. He didn't direct Shakespeare in Love. Produced it. Huh. I'm looking on IMDb. Oh, no, that's an all-time guilty pleasure for me. I like oh. Shakespeare in Love. I stand by it. First R rated movie I ever saw. What? First, First R rated movie, First R-rated movie oh, wow. I ever saw. Legends of the Fall. He directed Legends of the Fall. Look at this. Hey, he did Glory. Yeah. Some hey. big ones. Zwick. He's one of those. He's very proficient. You know, he doesn't have a whole lot of style, but he gets the job done and he, and he makes good movies. He makes epics. Yes. All right. His number last, one for me. Year, though, uh, nah. So much. Number one for me, uh, film set in Japan, low on the fun scale. In fact, uh, b- bereft of, uh, of fun almost entirely, but uh, powerful, moving, memorable. I'm talking about a documentary called The Cove. The Cove from 2009, Oscar winner for best documentary, directed by Louis Pichoyos. I believe this is the only non Japanese film on my list. And uh, yeah, we all know, well, it's it's film vault lore at this point. Uh, the very disturbing ending to the uh, the cove. Yep. Mm. Jillian came home from a long day at work to find her husband weeping into a uh, uh, a laundry bag. I was doing laundry, folding laundry, and crying like 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 somebody had just died. And it was thirty minutes well, after it ended. And I couldn't someone stop. did die. Yeah, a number whole, of things. All pod died. If you think I didn't think about that while I was over there a number of times, I don't even, I don't know what part of Japan that took place. I'm, I'm assuming like down south, Okinawa or something, but uh, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it, I was disturbed a number of times when I would think like, this is, I'm, I'm not that far from where. Did you ch- see like, any dolphin or whale on any menus? No. Horse meat though, just fine. Horse meat, yeah, I did see the horse meat. Yeah. All right, number, uh, number one for me is the movie that. Never gets brought up on the show. It probably should, because uh, it is a whole lot of fun, and it's one of Ridley Scott's more gritty, Black Rain movies, and that is Black Fucking Rain. Black Rain from 1989. Uh, I saw this in the theaters with uh, a girl who didn't like it nearly as much as I did, because I went back and saw it later that weekend again. And uh, it is a story about a couple New York cops. And uh, they have to go after the Yakuza. They follow them all the way to Japan, right? And I then think this- my parents rented this when I was either in 89 or 90. So I was like 11 or 12. And uh, all I remember is a uh, uh, character's head getting chopped off and a lot of uh, sad discussion about uh, the after effects of uh, Hiroshima. It's gritty. It's wet. It's rainy. It's dark. And it's the streets of Japan and Tokyo and it's kind of like the same vibe as what you get with uh, Blade Runner, right? Mm-hmm. But uh, it's it's more grounded in reality. You got ten Ken Takakura in here, Andy Garcia, Kate Capshaw, and of course Michael Douglas uh, in the lead, and oh, Luis Guzman's in this as well. Hey, and, uh, yeah, I I I love this gritty, hard boiled like throwback cop movie. It's not a throwback because it's from the era, you know, the late eighties where these movies. It's like it's like future noir or like modern noir. Yeah, it's like modern noir. I, I wouldn't say uh, that it was set in the future. That's more. But it's, it's not. It's set in but, modern times. But yeah, I remember just a ridiculous uh, scene where uh, a samurai has two swords on either side of a motorcycle coming down. He's scraping them off the side, either side of his of his motorcycle, and it's just sparks. You mean sparks everywhere in the wet streets? Very stylized. Very Ridley Scott. Uh, very mm-hmm. enjoyable. That black rain. My number one. My recollection again. It's been. 30 something years uh more almost more tony scott than ridley scott yes i mean i could see there uh, being an argument to be made like if you're going to get a movie confused like which one it'd be it'd be more like, this could be the one be like, could have been directed by either one but i mean there's a lot of blade runner in there that's ridley uh, scott all right good call haven't thought about black rain in quite some time fucking black rain
I've never thought of it. This is the first I've heard of it. Oh, yeah. Oh, really? well, it. it was kind of a big hit at the moment when it came out. <laughs> I bet it does not. I bet it hasn't aged well. <laughs> With I bet it's feeling New York extremely. Cops yeah. over in Japan. Uh, talking to, and I and watching the trailer, trying to you know get get re uh, familiar with it. You know, there there's a lot of like, you're not in New York anymore. You can't do things like that. <laughs> He's not wrong. He's just like headbutting like <laughs> perps. <laughs> I Hold need to on. watch. I need to watch all of these movies again after. Ah, oh, bad yeah. news. I was gonna say it'd be a great uh, watch along, but it's only available to rent. I think it's too good for a watch along. To be honest, I couldn't tell you. <laughs> you haven't seen it. You just you know saw it out of the corner of your parents' eye. Yeah, yeah, no, I was way too young. I, I couldn't digest this movie. All right, let's uh, let's wrap this baby up. Listener to list compiled by the Goose. Goose. So he uh, split it up. There's actually the top five is ja- or Luis Japanese Guzman. movies. Yes, but uh, he also said that there were uh, four American movies that got votes and he included those as well. So number Good. five for the Japanese films, uh, Battle Royale. Number four, The Handmaiden. The Handmaiden oh, was enjoyable. So, good. so good. enjoyable. Love that image. Number three, Audition. Number two, Two Way Tie, uh, I think. Uh, Missing slash Saguza. I don't know if that's the same movie or I don't know. But number one, Smart, Godzilla minus one. Mm. Just from uh, that's some reasons you bias, maybe. Oh no, it's glorious. I Four American that, movies. I've this is seen. this is not recency bias. Four American movies that got votes. Uh, number four is The Fast and the Furious Tokyo Drift. Oh my. Number three is Karate Kid Part Two. Oh, mm. they, what they point out that IMDb says it's filmed in Hawaii, not Japan. Uh, that's what the goose found. They out. got halfway there. Number two, Letters from Iwo Jima. That movie, fantastic. Just missed making my list. Please be be Mr. Baseball at number one. Please. Number one is Mr. Baseball. No, it is not. Yes, it is. No way. I was totally yes, joking. Yes, it is. <laughs> you know what? Mr. Baseball, way better than you would have expected. Yeah, not way that better. Bad. Not that bad. Mr. Baseball is all about a washed up Tom Selleck, uh, American baseball ball player going over to, uh, to you know, do his golden years. Classic and, fish out of the water. Maybe you could do that for the watch along. You know, oh. <laughs> I have not seen that in 30 years, Mr. Baseball. You know, the bad news bears go to Japan at one point, too. That's I mean, supposed to be very bad. Yeah. I'm All right. Bad news, Mr. Mr. Baseball is only available to rent. I saw uh, this almost made my uh, now new movies. I, I watched uh, Major League for the first time last year, and holy fuck, that was great. I That's loved Brian Major movie. League. Oh, Major That's League Rules. Movie. Oh, it's right. so good. Loves that movie. God damn, that was a great movie. Somehow under you know my parents rented Black Rain. I probably walked off to watch uh, Major League. Major League, great stuff. All uh, right, you want to want to gamble and get out of here? Ye- Please. Last time we gambled on Ghostbusters: Frozen Empire. Oh no! Anderson guessed sixty-eight. Brian guessed seventy-two. Oh no! With two hundred and fifty-six reviews, the actual Rotten Tomatoes score is forty-four percent, making Anderson the winner. I don't feel good about this. What do we do here? Because we have. You know, I'm 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 ahead with the listener list. I I've, I've seen a number of them, and I'm excited to talk about them. And I'll be talking to all of you if I have time to call you guys as well. Uh, however, I would like to assign you Dix the musical, but see, here's the we're falling into that trap of of assigning movies that have already been flick fast, and then they get double flick fashions. And I do want to hear your take, both of your takes actually on on Dix the musical. I think you would both appreciate certain aspects of this movie. Um, but no, I, I think I'm going to forfeit and just say, Hey, watch dicks. If you feel like it, you don't want to be dicks. So you're and assigning me dicks. I, why, I want you to, I'm more concerned with getting the listener list. Don't out. be concerned with that. I'm concerned with that. It's, it's hard earned money that they paid to us, Brian. And I don't like having debts. I don't first like it. Of all, first of all, you don't know that it's hard earned. Perhaps it was inherited money. Perhaps mm-hmm. it was found money. Maybe it was stolen. Maybe we shouldn't That's do right. any of them because possibly this, this money is all dirty. <laughs> <laughs> this whole this whole thing is just a money laundering scheme. Uh, all right, uh, Dix. Dix is pretty I, short. Dix yeah, goes, I mean, it's on HBO. Or Dix Max. goes down smooth. Or you could hit him with Godzilla. Godzilla Kong. 
No, I'd, I'd rather. <laughs> but we got Prince of Darkness. Thanks to An An Anthony. Uh, we got Jean de Florette and Manor of the Spring. Thanks to Stephen Morris. That's four hours of your time right there. And then we got RMN. Thanks to TJ. So let's uh, let's get these uh, in the next couple of weeks, Brian. All four of those. Okay. I'll get at least one of those next week. My mom mm -hmm. is coming into town. I oh, told, I told you, but you. You also said that it might be a good watch. Then. I think you, I I this is weird. But while watching Beaujean de Florette and Manor of the Spring, I was wishing that I was watching them with my mom because I love watching certain things with my mom. And these are two movies that would have been really fun to watch with my mom. Anyways. What about Dick's the musical? Not so much, but my mom, like my mom loves to watch hate, hate watch. Like she, she'll watch Seinfeld because she hates George Costanza so much. She'll <laughs> comment on how much she hates him. And there's a character all through Jean de Florette. Uh, which has uh, Gerard Dapardou, by the way, Brian. He's he, he comes in. Oh no, man! Movie, but he's he's peak Gerard uh, Gerard Dapardou. He's playing a hunchback in this movie, and um, there's a character in there that my mom would have hated so much. That's through both the movies, and uh, she would have just been commenting on how much she hates him throughout. It would have been very enjoyable to watch with her. Uh, okay, sorry. Tell me what the other uh, two films were. Jean de Florette and Manor of the Spring. You have uh, access no, to No, I know, but tell me the other two. And then Prince of Darkness and RMN. Gotcha. Prince, fuck you. Okay, um, let's, go. let's rock. This we're week, gonna... we're gambling on Monkey Man. Mm -hmm. Is it? Our, I thought it was two weeks. I guess, yeah, I guess we're there. I'm still a week behind in my life. Yeah, Monkey Man. Mm, monkey Man. There's something I should know about this. Is direct to vibe someone? No Monkey Man. It's it's the first film ever to come out that has not. It doesn't. It has. It's not known director. Yeah, that's Dev not Patel. what I'm saying. Yes, yeah, direct. It's written and it's directed and starring Dev Patel. Dev Patel. That's it. Yes. And yes, produced yes, by yes. Jordan Peele. All right. You see Jordan Peele in these AMC like you know promos like that come on before. Movies sometimes. Have you seen the one where they're doing it on Nope and talking about it's in Dolby theaters and it's talking about the glory of Dolby? I think oh I, yes, yes, yes. I did see this. He's doing like a version of somebody he would have been making fun of on Jordan Peele. I mean, uh, Jordan Peele. Key and Peele. Key Peele. Like he's doing a caricature of a douchey director that he would have been making fun of on that show. It's crazy. I love Jordan Peele, but he's just not the same Jordan Peele that I first fell in love with. Fuck. He's okay. been peeled. He's been peeled. <laughs> That's right to reveal a lesser object. Uh, All right. I don't know where to go with this. Monkey man. Monkey, monkey man. Um, Deb's pretty good. I, I love Deb, but I have no idea. Has he directed? Oh, no. He's pretty good. First time director. Uh, All right. I got a number. I like that Deb. He's, he's good. Yeah, me too. On three? Yep. One, two, 84. 78. Ooh. Interesting is 84. Brian, 78 with 55 reviews. The current Rotten Tomatoes score is 95%. How many? 55. I was getting, I was getting some, uh, some shades of RRR in the trailer. I don't think this is coming down by uh, 12 points. Vengeance. Monkey, man. Vengeance is good. Yeah. A lot of monkeys in the theater. Ugh. A lot of monkey, uh, monkey action <laughs> a lot of monkey. coming down the pike. A lot of monkey action. I am. I know Brian. You're not a fan of the uh, the series, but I love that new uh, Planet of the Apes, and I'm excited about the new one. Oh, I cannot wait! I'm, I'm doing a rewatch of all of them. Walking oh, out of Godzilla Kong, and then straight to a giant, you know, billboard in the lobby of. I, it was like right as I walked out of the theater. It's just there is Planet of the Apes. I'm like, yes, bring me more monkeys. Oh yeah, we're we're in peak monkey season. It's it's, peak glorious. Monkey. it's glorious. <laughs> Are uh, we gonna we have to talk year. Monkey Man? What's that? Are we gonna have to talk Monkey Man? Fuck we don't yeah, have Monkey Man. Uh, we'll be talking Monkey Man next week for sure. Seeing that shit Saturday. Is that a good one to bring my mom to? I don't think so. I have a feeling no, because the action thriller. Uh, Does she like monkeys? <laughs> she likes men. <laughs> I don't think there's a lot of monkeys in this. I, I think the character who, who dresses. Okay, here we go. Almost, uh, almost no monkeys. Two stars. <laughs> All right, let's go. Let's get out of here. 
All right, Avery. I uh, know I don't want to see your picture of fucking feet. I'll tell you that much. Is yep. this is this uh, a knock on me or is this about uh, a show I don't watch? Uh, it's it's a play on the show The Bear. Okay. All right. I hope they're not talking about me though. What are you talking? Because I'm the I'm the. Right Why would there, you hope the... they're not? Who cares? They make fun of you all the time. <laughs> make fun of both of us all the time. Why would you take take umbrage with the bear? It's really hurtful, Zach Robinson. All right, Zach Robinson. Just joking. That's good stuff. Good uh, joy, check man. it out, AndersonBrian.com. Thank you, Zach, for your listener art. We can always use more of that. Send it along. Yes, we're running low, so send them to contact tfv at gmail.com. And yes. if you uh, you can't use the Photoshop skills, get on that AI shit. <laughs> I was going to say, I feel like the AI uh, revolution is like uh, a uh, a gateway to more listener art. It's never been easier to put Brian in compromising positions. (laughs) Is that true? Very. Uh, I'll be back. Oh, I took hey, a picture. Hey, thanks to uh, Barricades, our feature artist this week. Thank you uh, for uh, providing the music. Check them out at andersonandbrian.com. Uh, go to Anderson and Brian on Instagram, Anderson and Brian on TikTok. While that's still around, The Film Vault on Facebook and Twitter. And yes, on YouTube, we are The Film Vault Podcast. Thank you, all of our Patreon listeners, for uh, sticking with us and supporting the show, assigning us films in some cases, and uh, watching along in some cases. Very fun. Very glad to have you along. Thanks, Giovanni, for your help. Drake, for your help. What is Drake doing? Is he new to the list? What is Drake? Drake, uh, Drake's the composer. Drake's oh, the, the, the yeah. he's the tar of the show. Yes, of course. I'm, I didn't recognize the, the last name. Drake, the uh, Drake's tar. doing all the uh, social media stuff <laughs> so far, which is uh, fantastic. He's doing a parent parental guide game and uh, hypotheticals. Lots of good stuff. Check out our socials because uh, Drake is populating it with lots of good content. Mike also, Cole, I've also hired him uh, kind of uh, over at uh, Loda for Bear, and he's doing some great work with Loda for Bear. That, that Drake is a very talented young fellow. What's he doing for Loda for Bear? He's Similar loading it. Going for, uh, for Grouper. I mean, for Groupers, for uh, the film ball. He's trying to get, get the word out and work on algorithms and trying to spread the word. All right. Thanks, yeah. Mike Cole. Thanks, Goose. And, of course, Eric Kath. Thank you for all your help. Check out Addie's Antiques. Lots of good stuff over there. Oh, and Comedy um, Confessional. Hey. Book. Comedy Confessionals back. Yes. Next week. And nice. uh, it'll be at uh, 8 o'clock at The Crow. It'll be April 12th. You can get tickets at Confess Comedy. And uh, the wonderful Florence Brummer will be in the house. Oh, nice. really? In the Is that house. Be? That's April 12th. Oh, so she's going to be in town. I got to. I got to. Yep. I'm, I'm actually. I have a meeting with Florence in five minutes with uh, all the oh. producers loaded for bears. So. Uh, I will I will ask her if uh, what's what's going on and if we're gonna get together and have her on the program. Yeah, All for right. sure. Good timing. All right, check us out at Patreon. Oh wait, shit! What? I gotta assign us to the next top five. Okay, okay. You never we never do better, like this. But better, yeah. Here you're hearing it here first, right in the nick of time. Ah, uh, I gotta uh, Daryl. Be- better as Japanese Dan. films. Better Brian, also known as Brian McCauley, has assigned us. Top five origin stories. Ooh, not nice. too shabby. Inspired, inspired. Yeah. See, so, and it can, uh, it can every be... once in a while, I don't know about you, Anders. Every once in a while, someone says, "Hey, are you worried to run out, run out of topics?" No, because there's so many of the good uh, ones you haven't right. thought of yet. So, top five origin stories, and just kind of you know musing about it for like you know five minutes or so, I came up with some really uh, fun ones that I'm excited to bring to the program. And they they can be full movies where the entire origin that is the movie, or they can be actual just you know like oh interesting back to it. yeah the, the the sequence of the film that is the origin story yeah so or All it could right. be an entire self contained movie so uh, top five characters origin stories so that will be next week thanks to better Brian McCauley and uh, just call him Brian. Let's uh, let's let's rock it. Who's Thanks, just, guys. Who's everything. just calling Brian McCauley? Thanks for that. Looking forward to that. Anderson's got a meeting, so sorry, guys. We got to cut this short. Oh, stop you. Until next time. We do it for Mango.